something as positive a movement as this one. So please, if you can put them on a silent mode so that no speaker is disrupted. The second one, let us respect each and every one of our speakers. We should not be having breakaway sessions where we discuss things while speakers are still on the podium. So that too, it's another rule that we should and must respect. And just two announcements. Uh, I, I, I'm so excited with the rain that we have. I can start by saying, Bula! Bula! It's what we've been looking for. Even the areas which I'm told in one town, a five-year-old child has never seen so much rain. They were a little bit confused initially. Now they have been inducted to the rain. The second good news, South Africa this morning, we woke up, the winner of Miss Universe is from this country. What a day in a year where we have seen, witnessed the most gruesome violence against women. When we are within the 16 days of the campaign against violence, uh, which is targeting women and children. Just to have such a relief, it's like rain in a desert. Coming not far away, we won the World Cup rugby in Japan. So we have reasons, despite blackouts, despite other things, these come as a pain relief of some kind. So let's go straight. Can we all stand up for the singing of our national anthem? Thank you very much. We may be seated. Now, for us to feel at home, we must be welcome and receive those opening remarks 
whether we are being asked to remove our jackets for those who have jackets, it will be within that welcome address. I'll be noting some of eminent persons in our midst as we go along. Such a pleasure that per square meter there is such a high concentration of high profile individuals. The likely possibility is that everywhere when you elbow somebody next to you, it's a very important, <coughs> you know, person. And more important, it's the warriors against corruption that are seated in this room, I hope. Uh, otherwise, if you happen to be heavily <laughs> implicated, we can meet outside in the holding room. We need to talk. <clears throat> so now we call upon Dr. Marcia Sotikwa, our Vice Principal at UNISA for Operations. Let's put our hands together. Thank you, Good morning to all of you, distinguished guests. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, who is not feeling too well this morning, I welcome all of you. I wish to extend a special welcome to our eminent guests. Minister Senzum Kunu, Minister of Public Service and Administration. We are delighted, sir, that you made time to be with us this morning. Advocate Richard Cezani, Chairperson of the Public Service Commission. Ms. Bekele Thomas, United Nations Resident Coordinator. Mr. Yutumileng Mongale, National Project Coordinator. UN ODC, His Excellency Nigel Cassie, British High Commissioner, Mr. Robert McBride, Co-Chairperson of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy Reference Group, Mr. David Lewis, Co-Chairperson of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy Reference Group, Lieutenant General Shadrach Libia, Head of the Directorate of Priority Crimes Investigation, Advocate Mutibi, Head of Special Investigating Unit. Advocate Shamila Batoy, National Director of Public Prosecution. Mr. Kimi Makwetu, South African Auditor General. <coughs> Professor Ntuli Madonsela, from the Stellenbosch Law Faculty Trust Chair in Social Justice. Ms. Busisiswe Mavoso, Chief Executive Officer of the Business Leadership South Africa, Father Mkachwa, Moral Regeneration Movement, all commissioners of the Public Service Commission present, members of the university community, distinguished guests, once more, welcome. The International Anti-Corruption Day has been observed since 2003 effectively nine years into our new democracy. It was built on a foundation of government for the people, by the people, to raise awareness for ant around anti-corruption. Delegates to the then convention were empowered to promote and strengthen measures to prevent and combat corruption more efficiently and effectively. They were then asked to promote and facilitate and support international cooperation and technical assistance in the prevention and fight against corruption. The responses from the different countries varied to this clarion call. In our own country, anti-corruption institutions were formed and related legislation was established. And after a series of announcements and interventions, the former president, then and now Current Chancellor of UNISA, Dr. Thabo Mbeki, said to South Africans as follows, open quote, 
South Africa needs to mobilize and combat the scourge of corruption. In his more vivid depiction of corruption, presented in the Nelson Mandela lecture of 2016, he took a step further and said, open quote, personal pursuit of material gain as the beginning and end of our life purpose is already beginning to corrode our social and national cohesion. Every day and every hour of our time beyond sleep, the demons embedded in our society that stalk us at every minute seem always to beckon each one of us towards a realizable dream and nightmare. With every passing second, they advise with rhythmic and hypnotic regularity, get rich, get rich, get rich. And thus it has become about that many of us accept that our common natural instinct to escape from poverty is but the same coin on whose reverse side is written the words, at all costs, get rich, close quote. He was right when he surmised that the new South Africa has inherited from an old, well-entrenched value system that placed individual acquisition of wealth at the very center of the society's value system, showing tolerance to theft of public property, personal enrichment at all costs, and the most theatrical and striking public display of that wealth. Close quote. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, year after year, the Auditor General produced reports that are exposing poor governance and accountability in managing our national resources. Our investigative units such as the Hawks, the SIU and SAPS are overwhelmed by numerous fraud and corruption cases. Our JSE listed private companies such as Hewlett's associated with the sugar industry, Stainoff and others are allegedly involved in corrupt activities. The auditing firms and multinational advisory firms have been identified as players in some of our national scandals. This year, all SOEs that were audited by the Auditor General failed to secure respectable audit outcomes. And bailouts, not profits, arise as the panacea to the incumbent executives. The get rich at all cost scheme has seen municipalities succumb to unprecedented lows, losing millions of the savings of poor people through VBS irresponsible behavior. The get rich at all cost scheme has also spread to universities, ladies and gentlemen. Since 2011, independent assessors have been appointed for several universities as a result of poor institutional governance and management. Corruption was identified as one of the contributing factors. Some students too capitulated in some cases, those who did not meet requirements were being admitted into universities or provided with exam scripts and answer, answer sheets if they were willing to pay the premium, that is. And the corrupter banks the rands he gets and the students accept the practice as standard until they are confronted with questions. Thus, notwithstanding the formation of new anti-corruption institutions and legislation, and the tone established at the top from 1986 to 2018, in total 22 years, the corruption index in South Africa has averaged only at 46.6 points out of 100, according to the Transparency International. South Africa achieved its highest score in 1996 at 56 points and has declined since. Apart from the fact that this data confirms that change is not quite apparent, and at a micro level, a certain generation in this country, considering that 22 years, has been born in this context. 
They have seen the get rich, get rich at all cost scheme succeed for certain members of society without consequences. The challenge to persuade our young and new leadership that another route out of poverty is possible is therefore all the more serious and significant. I wish to argue that the singular focus with those who have corrupted the country, the economy, the social fabric and institutions is a worthy but insufficient step at this juncture. We need to find a way to re-engineer the perceptions of our youth and future leaders and convince them that the get rich, get rich scheme at all cost has now not only eclipsed social cohesion, as those outside the get rich scheme are polarized from inside, it has also compounded poverty. In the words of Peter Egan, corruption is a major cause of poverty, as well as a barrier to overcoming it. The two scourges feed off each other, locking their populations into a cycle of pure misery. So what is to be get done against the belligerent scourge of corruption confronting us? Well, I can certainly say at institutions of higher learning, we need to equip our youth and our learners with tools of rebuilding and reconstituting a society, a nation, a country, wherein all of us can live and thrive. Part of the rebuilding will require immediate review of our governance systems, which must all be digitized, and all manual controls must be surrendered to the dustbin of history. We need to review our curriculum and cultivate intellectual virtues, which the Get Rich Scheme at all cost attempted to denigrate. This should happen at schools before learners have a drive at institutions of higher learning. In California, the Intellectual Virtues Academy was established in, 20, in 2013 to advance a culture of thinking, an appreciation of self-knowledge, an appreciation of strong community values. Invariably, when you focus more on the community, there is a lesser inclination toward preoccupation with self-interest. In our society, we need to seek and demand the truth. As argued by Alice Drager in her book, Galileo's Middle Finger, it is only through truth or evidence that social justice can be realized. We cannot let deeds of corruption be buried through our indifference or fatigue. Truth be told, in a corruption transaction, there are two parties, the corrupter and the corruptee. None are innocent and all are tainted. So let's engage them both. If we really seek to establish the truth. In the context of South Africa, one then hopes that the Zonda Commission will get to the truth, which will enable us to realize social justice. In institutions where the Auditor General is not prevalent, signs of worry are emerging. I believe the scope of the Auditor General should expand and one welcomes the enhancement of the noble institution's powers. So I hope today some of the questions that I have posed certainly to myself is, what went wrong in this our beautiful country? Why are we experiencing such high levels of bribery and corruption? And they are not ceasing, even as we sit here. Who amongst us is responsible? What measures can we put in place to ensure that we turn the corner? What lessons can we learn from others? What insights can we draw from available data? Are we taking advantage of technology systems and the 4IR to develop lasting ways of resolving our problems? Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNISA, I welcome you all to an enlightening session. I'm grateful to all of you for taking time of your schedule to join us and come to our shores, upholding the import of the topic of anti-corruption. I thank you.
Thank you, Marcia, for such pointed words and reminder of this get rich scheme, which is a sign of a consumer society where you just want to consume, consume new latest model of the phone, you want to buy it, you retire the other one before you have known even 90% of its functions. <laughs> and you never give them to your uncle. They are all piled in a drawer somewhere. Uh, as we move on, I have noticed the member of the National Planning Commission, Utemba Lamini, let's put our hands together for him. And uh, we also have the Finnish ambassador. Uh, when I say Finnish ambassador, I don't mean I've finished the ambassador, I mean <laughs> Finland. <laughs> then you say Finnish. <clears throat> when you, because it could cause confusion. They say there's no country called Finnish. <laughs> they celebrated their National Independence Day on Friday. Let's put our hands together for them. And Finland, together with the other uh, Nordic countries like Sweden, Norway, they are always ranked very high on anti-corruption and transparency in the world. They even have happiness index. Can you imagine if we had happiness index? I just judge by Twitter and social media, Facebook, that we're very noisy, argumentative, and very angry society. So if that was the case. In our midst, we do have two young, bright people in a competition globally and amongst BRICS members where young people were asked to design a poster on anti-corruption. And also another one design a short video. We had some of the people who have done very well, young people. One of them is Tutukani Ndunge. I believe she is in our midst, Tutukani but whether the person is here or not, let's put our hands together for the winner. Tutugani crafted a video which impressed on the anti-corruption message. Then we also have the one who crafted and designed a poster, and that is Pompi Matibe. Is Pompi around? Let's put our hands together for Pompi. The world belongs to the design artist that we have. Some of these posters will be showing up here for the work being done. I'm told that one of the winners is not around, has gone to Moscow to collect the gift. And I wish the winner could have asked me to even hold bags <coughs> as they travel in that direction. But for our young people who are creative, in messaging these positive, effective campaign messages. Let's put our hands together for them. <laughs> now as we move on to get the message by the United Nations, our partner, our proud partner, and that message will be by Ms. Becca Le Thomas, and as she comes this side. I want to remind you of what Martin Luther King Jr. said about conviction. He said, if you have not identified something for which you're prepared to die, you're not fit to live. It's as simple as that. So let's put our hands together for Ms. Bekele Thomas. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director. Good morning, everybody. 
Our dear Minister for Public Service and Administration, Honorable Senzo Chunu, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa, Professor Sosikwa, Chairperson of the Public Service Commission, Advocate Richard Sizani, National Director of Public Prosecutions, Advocate Shamila Batohi, Lieutenant General Lebea from the Hawks, former Public Prosecutor, Advocate Tuli Madoncella, Representative of Auditor General, Mr. Kimi Makwetu, Father Samangiliso Nkwatswa, <laughs> from the Moral Regeneration Movement. I'm so sorry, I mean, it's so difficult for me. Ethiopian names are very difficult, but you know, South African names are really challenging. <laughs> CEO of Business Leadership uh, South Africa, representatives of the Diplomatic Corps, and um, I would salute the presence of the Ambassador of Finland. Speakers and delegates from the other law enforcement agencies, uh, delegates from other organs of the state and civil society, Officials from uh, the UN, my colleagues, I see the representative of UNDP, are you here? Uh, and also officials of the Public Service Commission and the university. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank our co-hosts, you know, UNSA, UNISA, uh, the Ministry of Public Service and Administration and the Ministry of Justice for together with us marking today's International Anti-Corruption Day. This is part of the global movement, as you know, against one of the greatest crimes to human development. It takes place in every country, in every continent on Earth. It's not solely a development issue, like my sister just outlined. It's not only an economic issue it is definitely becoming a security issue. And the world needs to take it far more seriously than before. The irony, the irony of the discourse on global governance is that corruption is widely condemned, yet widely practiced. Individual firms, national governments, and international development organizations have invested heavily in programs to ensure that their leaders and employees are ethical and clean from any corrupt practices. But yet, there is an overwhelming evidence that these investments are not yielding as much results as we desire. Given the corrosive impact of corruption, today's event is therefore intended to calling governments and citizens of the world to redouble our collective efforts through even greater investments in solutions for decisive action. I repeat, decisive action against corrupt practices. Ladies and gentlemen, when the global community adopted the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, it recognized that hundreds of millions of people around the world who continue to live under highly precarious circumstances, subjected to poverty and hunger as a result of unemployment and inequalities and other vulnerabilities caused by environmental degradation and climate change, such as droughts and flooding. Inasmuch as the SDG framework provided us with a potentially transformative agenda to provide long-lasting responses to these multi-dimensional challenges facing our world, there was equally a strong recognition that an important prerequisite for implementing the SDGs is the building of strong institutions to foster more citizen-responsive, resilient states and responsible societies. Within the SDG framework, SDG number 16 
specifically advocates for peace, justice, and strong institutions with a strong focus on the following indicators, which I think are highly relevant for our discussion this morning. The first one is to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. Second one is by 2030, significantly to reduce illicit financial and arms flows, strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets, and combat all forms of organized crime. Third, substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. Fourth, develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels. And lastly, the fifth, ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. As we pursue this broad goal of building strong institutions for a more sustainable development, these indicators, in my opinion, present us with the specifics of what we should be focusing on. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable minister, earlier I stated that the irony of corruption is that it is widely condemned, yet widely practiced. Despite the strong emphasis on anti-corruption, strong institutions, and rule of law in the SDGs, the World Economic Forum estimated that the global cost of corruption is at least 2.6 trillion, or 5% of the global gross domestic product. According to the World Bank, businesses and individuals pay more than 1 trillion in bribes every year. The effects on development are just enormous. Using SDG 3, and healthcare as an example of the cost of corruption on the lives of ordinary citizens and their development, the World Economic Forum estimates that each year, each year, 7.35 trillion is spent on healthcare worldwide. 7.35 trillion dollars is spent on healthcare worldwide. But, but 455 billion is lost to fraud and corruption, leading to the deaths of more than 140,000 children. Corruption kills. Transparency International's recent report, Global Corruption Barometer, GCB, for Africa 2019, highlighted that some 14% of people who accessed healthcare services paid bribes to healthcare workers, and bribery affects women and children more than the rest of the population. This is, of course, not limited to access to healthcare, but is present across the delivery of a range of social services, such as, such as education, access to social protection, and important resources for economic activity for the poor, such as land and water resources. Corruption takes away people's livelihoods and their lives. It's for this reason that the former World Bank president defined corruption as the art of stealing from the poor and the weak, as the cancer of society, and claimed that it should be considered as crime against humanity. In the South African context, much of the evidence coming out of the commissions of inquiries underway is revealing that these challenges and their impact on development have been particularly painful. Addressing the Financial Times Summit in London in October this year, President Ramaphosa pre presented a very glim picture on the cause of corruption to South Africa suggesting that 
a lot of money, quote, a lot of money was siphoned off the coffers of the state through corrupt means. And some of those were done in a very sophisticated way involving the blue chip companies of great world reputations. The costs run way be beyond 500 billion rands, with some suggesting as high a figure as one trillion rands. By any stretch of the imagination, these are astronomical figures, especially when one considers that South Africa's 2019 budget had total expenditure of 1.8 trillion rands. These estimates mean that corruption over the past couple of years has cost the country between 27% to 55% of its 2019 total budget. When one considers the enormous development challenges facing townships and rural areas, any diversion of funds away from public expenditure is surely taking away the livelihoods and lives of the poor. Honorable Minister, one area, one area I think that the UN and government of South Africa can partner on is on this very area of calculating the direct and indirect costs of corruption and maladministration in the country and understanding the impact of this course on development. This would be an important area of work in terms of elevating the discussion and rallying society behind national efforts to fight corruption. It would also be a good way of promoting the values of transparency and accountability. Honorable Minister, the South African government's effort of opening itself up through the state capture, the PIC, SARS, and MPA commissions are commendable. These are actions of a government that is fully committed to understanding the roots, manifest manifestations, and practice of corruption within the government. This certainly bodes very well for ongoing national efforts at addressing the challenges of corruption. However, all the initiatives relative to investigation and legislation and data and information will not have any meaning if people do not feel the force of these penalties. The United Nations is therefore ready to strengthen further the prosecution capacity of the country. It was with interest that I recently learned through the response of the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services to a parliamentary session that close to 400 million has been spent since the establishment of the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture. This is yet another example of the costs that the country has to incur in dealing with corruption. It's unfortunately, and we understand, it's unfortunately a cost that is necessary to avoid further erosion of state funds. However, it's also money that could have been used to support the many orphans in need of social services, the young graduate who is anxiously waiting to apply his potential, the mother who is straddling between two, three jobs to feed her family, etc. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on this day, it's perhaps useful also to take stock of South Africa's performance and ranking on how it is fighting corruption and ensuring access to justice to all and to the poorest of the poor. South Africa scored 43 points out of 100 on the 2018 Corruption Perceptions Index reported by Transfer Transparency International. This sentiment is consistent with the finding of the SDG 
Country Report of 2019, published by Statistics South Africa, which indicates that the proportion of the population who reported having been asked for a bribe has increased from 0.09% in 2016 to 0.31%, 31% in 2018, or 0.31% in 2018. This finding, together with the revel revelations emanating from the commissions of inquiry established by the government, depicts the extent of the challenges of corruption faced by the country. Consistent with the above, the 2019 Global Corruption Barometer for Africa found that 40% of South African respondents believed that some police officers are corrupt, and 30% believed that most of them are. A worrying 19% believed that all police officers are corrupt. Minister, these are perceptions that South Africans have of some of their most critical national institutions, which are responsible for maintaining an environment of safety and security and leading the fight against corruption in the country. This is something that the country must attend to because it's a worrying, worrying perception. In the State of the Nation address in February, His Excellency President Ramaphosa highlighted the challenges confronting South Africa regarding the problem of corruption. He commended the commissions of inquiry that have unearthed the depth of corrupt practices in state institutions. He maintained that the evidence of corruption that emerges must be evaluated by the criminal justice system and where there is a basis to prosecute, there will be a swift action in order to recover stolen public funds. The president further made concrete commitments to tackle these corrupt practices. Included in these commitments is the establishment of the investigative directorate in the office of the national director of the public prosecution to deal with the evidence emanating from the Commission of Inquiry into state capture. Indeed, this commitment was acted upon when the President issued the proclamation for the establishment of the Directorate and later in May announced the head of the Directorate. There are other several significant efforts made by the government to address the problem of corruption. These include the development of the comprehensive national anti-corruption strategy, which is in the process of being finalized, but I beg you, once finalized, let's implement it. Second, the recent establishment of the Special Investigation Unit Tribunal <coughs> to finalize matters referred for civil litigation following the conclusion of investigation by the Investigation Special Unit. Third, the establishment of a task team in October 2019 by the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation to tackle corruption in municipalities and the launch of the Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum on the 1st of October 2019 by the President. We commend, we truly commend the President's commitment. And as the UN, we stand ready to provide support to ensure that all these efforts bear fruits. South Africans demand results, and we will stand ready to support the government in delivering these results. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I must emphasize that to eradicate a culture of corruption, we must view all forms of corrupt practices, big or small. With the, contempt that, uh, with the contempt they deserve, and to respond to them with decisiveness. We must deal with all kinds of corruption with the same measure, zeal, and apply the same standards. We must adopt the Chinese way, 
deal with both the tigers and the flies, and deal decisively with both high-ranking and low-ranking public officials, business leaders, and other individuals with the same zeal and determination. We should all say no to corruption. Government alone cannot root out the scourge of corruption. This is a whole of society obligation. Remember, behind each figure stolen, there is a life lost. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to present to the Minister, the Public Service Commission, and other state institutions leading this work, two additional potential areas of collaboration with the United Nations in South Africa. First is working on harnessing the contribution of citizens to fight corruption to the, through their active citizenry and ensuring that the fight against corruption is neither an elitist or statistical exercise. This will require an empowered citizenry to play the role to envisage, we envisage for it. This directly leads me to the second area of work. I think we could enhance uh, the area of work. I think we could enhance national anti-corruption efforts and this is greater, this is through greater investment in technology. My, my dear sister just alluded to it. This is through greater investment in technology platforms to promote transparency in the work of government. We stand ready to work with you to identify what other countries are doing and have done in these two areas with the intention of developing uniquely a South African homegrown solutions to the challenges the country faces. Ladies and gentlemen, a new generation of change makers demand to place accountability and integrity at the center of global leadership across businesses, politics, media, and civil society. To this end, the United Nations has embarked on a campaign called hashtag youth for justice to mobilize and empower young people, the future leaders, as they are key to ensuring sustainable solutions to combating corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, once again, the United Nations calls for the global action to address corruption, to build an ethical society so that we eradicate poverty and realize the SDGs. <clears throat> and for this, we must all unite together. We must all work together. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together again for United Nations representatives. We can do better. This is United Nations. There is no other bigger organization than this. And the last round of applause for those two partnership areas that she was mentioning. Thank you very much. Wow. Corruption is widely condemned and yet widely practiced. Are we schizophrenic? Because we condemn it, but we do it. Maybe one of the reasons is because people think, uh, as we also welcome the director of the NPA uh, advocate, but only let's put our hands together for him. Thank you. And the second part, which I think this meeting can adopt, if we can take it to the UN to declare corruption a crime against humanity, just like we did against apartheid. It was the figures that were mentioned here were quite scary. If corruption was a country, it would be in the top 20 countries in terms of GDP. <laughs> the figures I was hearing here, it would be in the most advanced category of countries. Just the figures. We also recognize here India's 
Consular General, who is in our midst, let's put our hands together for Ms. Anshu Ranjan. We can do better. That's a member of BRICS. We are part of BRICS. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately for the speakers who will be coming forward for this session, you will not have to, I mean, you will not be able to avoid mentioning people with cliques. The other one is so equal. <laughs> so it's unavoidable. Unless you say Marcia. The other one is Mkunu. Unavoidable. If you go for his clan name, it's Matingwana, so it's still unavoidable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, having hanged around Ethiopians for some time, I would simply say, oh, my second level. Uh, there are certain names in, in Amharic, like Kokocha, Kulf, Konjo, <laughs> all those, a little bit of what I learned. Without any waste of time, as we move forward, we now ask for the message from the chairperson of the Public Service Commission, Advocate Kali Pile Sizani. Let's put our hands together. Uh, for name dropping purpose, we once lectured in the same university some years back <clears throat> uh, with the chair. Let's put our hands together. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I will not uh, do the greetings. The, the chairperson has already done it, and the speakers before me. I just want to just welcome uh, for the National Anti-Corruption Forum, our new chairperson, uh, Minister Mkunu, who is chairing the National Anti-Corruption uh, Forum and uh, he, at least it's good that we have him at the beginning of the year. The role of the Public Service Commission has been that of an acting secretariat, supporting the entire forum and its uh, stakeholders. But it's an acting position that uh, the, the chairperson will, will sort out as he's beginning to sort out everything. Let me join other speakers this morning on behalf of the Public Service Commission to speak on this anti-corruption day uh, on the theme, United Against Corruption, Building a Culture of Accountability for Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to stand before you this morning to observe that this day that must constitute one of the most important on our calendar. International Anti-Corruption Day is a day on which we reflect meaningfully on how this global concern impacts on the lives of ordinary people, men, women, and persons who are on the receiving end of the devastating impacts of corruption. The United Nations Convention on Corruption, UNCAD, describes corruption as an insidious plague that has a wide range of corrosive effects on societies. It undermines democracy and the rule of law, leads to violations of human rights, distorts markets, erodes the quality of life, and allows organized crime, terrorism, and other threats to human security to flourish. In the South African context, Section 3 of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act of 2004 defines corruption, among others, as the abuse of office for personal gain. Reading the whole section, you will still find that a number of, of ordinarily corrupt practices will not be included and will fall short of the definition that is set up by the United Nations Convention on Corruption. The fight against corruption is perhaps one of the most defining struggles of our time. It is a priority struggle precisely because there's far too much at stake. While both the developing and developed countries are battling with this catch, Empirical evidence suggests to us that corruption hurts the poor disproportionately. 
It is a major contributor to instability and poverty and is a dominant factor driving fragile countries towards state failure. Here on the African continent, we know too well the calamitous effects that corruption has had on our nation states, effects that have rendered some of these nation states now failed states. The Global Financial Integrity, a non-profit organization, estimates that from 2005 to 2014, Africa lost between 500 billion rands and 800 billion rands in illicit financial flows. This represents about 74% of all finance required, about 1.2 trillion, to develop infrastructure to service Africa's growth needs. Corruption is devastating in countries such as Egypt, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and a number of others. In South Africa, corruption has had immeasurable brutal consequences on the poor. Its institutionalization and systemization in political and economic spheres have been boundless. According to the Minister of Trade and Industry, Ibrahim Patel, corruption costs our country's GDP almost 30 billion annually, as well as a loss of 76,000 jobs that would otherwise have been created. Evidently, corruption hinders investment, both domestic and foreign, reduces growth, restricts trade, distorts the size and composition of government expenditure, it weakens the entire financial system and strengthens the underground economy. Most importantly, there is a strong connection between corruption and increasing levels of poverty and income inequality. But the costs of corruption are not just financial, they are also socio-political. At a deeper level, corruption threatens our very democracy. It erodes trust in institutions of state, which in turn weakens the state capacity to fight corruption. A dangerous byproduct of the erosion of trust in the state is increasing crime. Additionally, corruption within the criminal justice system in a country like South Africa also has implications for such serious crimes as gender-based violence. When only one in nine women report sex crimes, in part due to a lack of trust in the system and a belief that criminal justice actors are corrupt, parameters are set for the continued violation of women, girls, and the LGBTIQ community that is already vulnerable and disenfranchised. More than anything, and perhaps more significantly, corruption calls into question the very legitimacy of the state. State legitimacy is a key aspect of state-society relations. State-sanctioned or enabled corruption results in negative experiences of citizens with the state, a legacy of mistrust, and rejections of legitimacy of the state institutions. Legitimacy matters because without it, there is likely to be conflict and disorder. The former Secretary General of the United Nations and Nobel Peace Laureate, Kofi Annan, once described corruption as a disease and argued and argued that transparency is an essential part, and argue that transparency is an essential part of the treatment of the cancer of corruption. The former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, explained the specific disease that it is when he contended corruption is a cancer, a cancer that eats away of citizens' faith in democracy. In South Africa, our democratic institutions are in the process of being revitalized to carry out its, their constitutional mandate, to give them some semblance of credibility and legitimacy. Part of the corruption in South Africa was an attack on institutions in the criminal justice system. In many other countries, they would have fewer and stronger institutions to fight corruption. In our country, there is a multiplicity of institutions with too much duplication, working against each other, wastage of resources, and a lack of cooperation and communication. There is a need for them to be streamlined and strengthened fewer but better. 
Building a culture, a culture of accountability and ensuring transparency at the radiography against corruption. They are what can and will kill the insidious disease that is corruption, a disease that threatens to tear our country apart and defer its dream of fashioning a developmental state, a disease to which the African continent has lost much to. To win the war against corruption, an ethical culture must be inculcated within the public service and society at large. In order to achieve this, we need public servants who are selfless, strive this to sustain and improve the lives of people by being professional, ethical, principle-centered, and values-driven. We need public servants who will transform society and resolve the challenges we face today by committing to the constitutional values and principles both in Section 1 and Section 195 of the Constitution, which govern public administration in general. In addition, ethical leadership that is grounded on principles of integrity, competency, responsibility, accountability, and transparency remain key to fighting the scourge of corruption. The revelations from the Zondo Commission have actually exposed the lack of ethical leadership in our country, both in the private and public sector. To build a culture of accountability and ensure transparency demands that we sustain good governance and institute good models of monitoring and evaluation of our systems. We must harness the power of the people by creating pathways that give citizens relevant tools to engage and participate in their government. So you can see that we already agree with the United Nations rep on the need to collaborate on the issue of an active citizenry. Strengthening citizens demand, demand for anti-corruption and empowering them to hold government accountable is a sustainable approach that helps to build mutual trust between citizens and government. And today, uh, on behalf of Minister Mkuno, I did receive a, 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 a petition from, uh, from civil society led by the uh, Katrada Foundation and Outer and many others, actually emphasizing this thing, uh, Shamila, they were emphasizing very importantly that the principle is important, that if you do offend, you must be hunted down, you must be arrested, you must be prosecuted, and you must be appropriately punished. And that is what is lacking in our country today. <coughs> Strengthening citizens' demand for anti-corruption and empowering them to hold government accountable is a sustainable approach to, that helps to build mutual trust between citizens and government. Therefore, we need an active citizenry that is informed as ac and has access to information. We need to move away from what was used to be an article of faith of the old British public service that if, you know, if nobody knows what we are doing as a public service, then nobody knows what we are doing wrong. Lastly, but just as importantly, international loopholes must also be closed, particularly by countries to whom Africa's illicit capital outflow is directed. Without access to the international financial system, corrupt public officials throughout the world would not be able to launder and hide the proceeds of looted state assets. Major financial centers ed urgently need to put in place ways to stop their banks and cooperating offshore financial centers from absorbing illicit flows of money. Ladies and gentlemen, on this International Anti-Corruption Day, as we reflect on the strides that we have made in fighting this cancer, may we also recommit ourselves to the struggle for building a culture of accountability for sustainable development. For those who are keen to join the fight against corruption, let me end by quoting Thomas Paine in the crisis, and I quote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands by it now deserves the love and the thanks of many women and men. I apologize for the gender insensitive language. So for whatever and backwards never in the fight to rid our country of this scourge of corruption, I thank you. Again, let's put our hands together for Advocate Cesar.
because as the chair of the Public Service Commission, most studies do show, including the Indulamiti South Africa Scenarios 2030 and the work that Professor Madonzela is doing, that two things will make a difference. Effective leadership and good institutions. Those two things to combat corruption are very important. Of course, as it was alluded to, in our midst, we do have the Kathrada Foundation. Let's put our hands together for the Kathrada Foundation. <laughs> we do have NGOs, Outa. Let's put our hands for Outa. And many other NGOs I may not have recognized here, especially the one that I've not mentioned is the most important. <clears throat> it's not because it's not important. As we move on to our keynote address, and I'll be introducing the minister. As speakers were speaking, I was just wondering, in South Africa, we have some of the best institutions, best constitution rated in the top 10 in terms of our audit systems, King 1, 2, 3, and 4. But still, we steal. What, 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 what is wrong? <laughs> there is something about human agency because laws are there but the conscience, the individuals, seem to go underneath. And it's not just government alone, it's the private sector. Once those twins combine, mischief comes. And the other problem, as I'm about to introduce the minister, is because we say, no, this is a smaller thing that we steal. Samuel Johnson says, Chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. It's those smaller things, like pregnancy, corruption, you can't say I'm partially corrupt. <laughs> it's all or nothing. <laughs> so you can't say it's a small anyana thing because it will grow. Now the person I'm going to introduce in essence, needs no introduction because he's a tried, tested leader who is well known to us. But I'll go through the ritual for which I've been instructed to do that our minister, Minister Senzo Mtunu, whose claim, clan name is Matsingwan, was educated at the University of Zululand and guess where else? UNISA. <laughs> you see, generally. <laughs> Even Nelson Mandela in the biographies, they talk of Forte Vets, where he was causing mischief, but where we finally gave him the certificates, the first and the second degree, it was here at UNISA. <clears throat> then he worked as a teacher. I love a person who has worked with people as a teacher. In St. Augustine High School in Mutu, before being transferred to Eshowe and taught at Impande High School. He has been for decades in politics in various leadership positions. Secretary General of the ANC in KwaZulu Natal uh, in 1994 onwards, and he was the MEC in the province. He had chaired the portfolio committees. He rose through the ranks and ultimately chaired the ANC, became the premier of the province of KwaZulu-Natal, and uh, in the sixth administration, he has now been given probably one of the most difficult tasks how to harness our public service to deliver on the promise of democracy. He is our Minister of Public Service and Administration, 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together as we welcome <laughs> Minister Sendon. To me. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Program Director, Professor Somato Tafikin. I haven't come across your English name or baptismal name. I only know this one. It could be both. Oh, thank you. The uh, people up front here on the main desk a representative of the United Nations, of whom we are grateful, very grateful for your presence in your speech, Ms. Bekele Thomas. May I just say that, uh, um, no, let me just go on. Um, the uh, representative of uh, this institution, the University of South Africa, Professor Sotikwa, standing in for Professor Mandla Makanya. Um, Advocate Richard Cezanne of the Public Service. There are also a number of um, remarkable people in, our, in, in this room today. My honor the presence of the um, ambassador from Finland um, the um, or advocate Shamila Batoy who has just joined us from um, NPA, uh, the representative from the uh, from the Auditor General's Office, Professor Tuli Matonzela from uh, uh, down in Cape Town, Stellenbosch. Thank you very much for your presence. Um, a representative of business, if they are here, were to be joined by Busisiwe Mavuso, Baba of Usmangali Kajwa, Mora Regeneration Movement. Thank you very much for your presence. Um, we also have um, Lieutenant General Shadrach Libya, who is amongst us. Uh, he's head of Directorate of Priority Crimes Investigation. So if you, if you commit a high priority crime, <laughs> you have a director that you are challenging and is here with us today. And all protocol calls observed. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of you for your presence today. This is a, a very important day in our country, South Africa, where we're gathered to mark our preferred stance or position, just to state our position as a nation gathered here today in relation to crime, but much more so in relation to corruption that seems to be characterizing our country more and more in wider circles, and even here domestically, among our own people on the ground. I want to say it's very important because uh, we have to clarify ourselves and say where exactly do we stand on corruption. We are quite a number here, and I know there are quite a number of other people outside. And all of us uh, gathered here should say in one voice that we commit against corruption, any form of corruption, and begin to identify those amongst ourselves who are into this practice and get involved in the fight and not just commit, but involve, get involved in the fight. It's good that South Africa is um, one of the 
a signatories to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. But we are, we are cognizant of the fact that we have to earn our membership and make good of that signature that we are attached in 203 to this convention by counting, by making South Africa count among other countries that are at the top in the fight against corruption. At the moment, it doesn't seem to be, we don't seem to be where we should be as a, as a signatory in this important convention. Transparency International describes uh, corruption as follows. It says, I quote, is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. It's, it's a short definition. Abuse of entrusted power for private gain. But it goes on to say it's a major obstacle to democracy and the rule of law as offices and institutions lose their legitimacy when they are misused for private advantage. It depletes national wealth. It corrodes the social fabric of society. and results in an environmental degradation. This is where Transparency International stand in terms of describing or defining corruption. But I'm not inviting us to spend a lot of time trying to define corruption, we know it. And there's one part of us that will always assure us of the best definition. It's your own conscience. Your own conscience will always tell you when you get corrupt. More than any definition in any book, it will always tell you, you are now entering corruption. And as soon as your, your conscience rings the bell inside you, you, you never rest. Each time at night there's a sign of police or anything, you are the first one to rise <laughs> to make sure it is not police and they are not here for you, even when you drive whatever you do. So we're not short of definition, but we just want, to, we said this just to confirm in case your head is in doubt about what your conscience tells you on a daily basis. But somebody has posed a question, and let me respond to it. It was the program director talking about the constitution, institutions, and everything. That demonstrates capability that South Africa is actually capable. It does have instruments of fighting corruption, including further definitions to a point where the kind of definitions that are needed by police, by prosecutorial authorities, by courts, all those definitions are there. And that the question is being asked here. So capability is one thing, but capacity is different, something else. Do we have capacity? In other words, do we have individuals that are geared, that are made up for this task, for which they occupy these various offices and chairs? We need to ask ourselves these questions. Just to ensure that the people who are in these positions understand where we stand, especially as government. 
Where we stand, we stand in a position where we look up to you, all of you, who are in these positions, to execute your tasks as if there is no other day tomorrow. Objectively, timelessly, effectively, and without any fear or favor. That's where we stand. So don't doubt us as government, as you do your tasks, as you perform your tasks. Understand us to be fully behind you. If not, just next to you, or even in front of you if you want to. So everywhere, just to give you support. So never doubt. And I'm saying this very confidently on behalf of our government, on behalf of our president. Don't doubt. Now, when we take a fight against corruption, especially with regard to NGOs and civil society at large, we want to encourage you to throw overboard the old question of race in the fight against corruption, the old question of positions of people who occupies what position, and therefore, what do we say and how do we say it? And any other identification or cla of class or whatever, let's just focus on, on, on corruption as a target and leave all these other titles and be decisive on it. The president has uh, clearly outlined in, in the last sauna in August or in July after elections, it was June, stating what as a nation we are looking forward to, stating among other things Priority, uh, prioritizing economic transformation and job creation. Economic transformation in, in, and emphasizing on economic growth in particular, which we so, we so much need in our country. And we say so as we, as we appreciate our blessing today of rain, which is a sign that God has not forgotten us and all parts of the Republic. But we know we're battling an uphill on, on this matter. But we need to overcome it. We are, we are in fact on a cliff in terms of the economy of the country. And consequently, our fiscus also makes us a country that's standing on a cliff. And we need to shift from this and one of the facilitators is actually to state here very clearly that we are against corruption as it would impact on our efforts to turn the tide around on the economy. The other priorities, education and skills and health, that we need to improve on these areas, that we need to consolidate the social wage through, among other things, reliable and quality basic services, spatial integration, human settlement and local government, social cohesion and safe communities, and of course, a capable ethical and developmental state which falls directly within our portfolio that we need to, take, to, to, to tackle and make sure we succeed. And the last one is a better Africa and, and a better world. 
All these priorities are, impo are, are very important, but are impossible to achieve if we don't commit and get involved in the fight against uh, corruption and commit all the resources that we need in order to succeed. The PSC, as Advocate Richard has said, working with the PSA that is ourselves, but PSC in particular plays the role of uh, providing secretariat uh, to the National Anti-Corruption Forum. Now I want to acknowledge here that there's tended to be a bit of a lapse on the functionality of the forum. And we want to state it very clearly here that if there has been a perception that we are getting soft in this regard as a, as a country and particularly as government, we are here to assure you and assure everybody out there that not necessarily. We are rejuvenating ourselves and the efforts to make sure the, the forum is once more functional. And we want to urge business, we want to urge civil society, we want to urge individuals in their own in their own personal capacity to join hands with all of us in the country to demonstrate our stance and our abhorrence against corruption, any form of it, any level where it is. You may also be aware that the AU some time ago established NEPAT and under it established APRM as a joint effort in the continent to make sure that we work with the United Nations, but also make our own efforts as a nation to make sure that we mobilize civil society to take up their civil duties as individuals and not to rely too much on government. As government changes, it may, it's made of individuals. And I don't know what sometimes happen when you get to government. Maybe you see some, some of the things that you may not have seen before and then uh, some of the things that shouldn't happen, happen. And therefore, we need to rely on civil society and of course, state institutions that are positioned to fight against crime and, and, and corruption. But I, I'm just saying we are also on the effort of APRM. We are at the last stage of reviving APRM and we're very happy with that. It's something that we've, we have occupied our time in the last seven months since we got appointed. And tomorrow and Wednesday, we will be establishing the National General Council, which is a body that oversee the work of APRM nationally and will be leading towards the second generation review of, uh, of, 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 our, gov of our government and governance uh, in the country as called upon by the, the AU in terms of us being a founding member of, of APRM together with uh, four other countries. And therefore, we are saying, let's join hands. Civil society must have a voice. Civil society has power in terms of numbers. Civil society has no bounds in terms of um, airing their views and, and, and demonstrating their stance uh, on, on anti-corruption. There's a document that was uh, uh, reviewed or revived in 2017 on, uh, on, on, on a strategy against uh, corruption, but we have tended, as I've said, uh, to lapse uh, on these matters. So on our side, we, as a, a DPSA, we have a, a, 
uh, I've been experiencing a little bit of a problem in terms of uh, our organogram. Um, and so we had, to, we had to look at that as the, as the first thing when we go to office. And I'm happy that we are finalizing it. Uh, we would have finalized it long ago and, 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 the, and then position the unit called Tau, um, which is a unit that we are going to be relying on as a country, but particularly as DPSA, uh, to actually uh, be our lead unit in the public service to fight to wage a war against uh, uh, corruption. We have now positioned that. It's just that um, an, an organogram is not a question of a minister sitting in the office and then saying, this is what we're going to do. We have to consult the whole host of people. And they start saying, no, not this way, not that way, and so on. We're through all that. It's necessary trouble that you go through. And, and it delays you quite a bit. But we are in the final ends uh, on that. We have signed it off and, and we will position that unit and, and populate it and equip it and resource it such that it is able to perform its task as, as is, is, is expected of us. <laughs> we are delighted with your comments from the United Nations that uh, we are not alone in, this, uh, in these commissions that have been set up uh, by the president. Indeed, we support the president on this, and we support the commissions themselves uh, as they do their work in terms of unearthing um, some of the corrupt activities as they get, they, as they get identified. Um, this was done at a very difficult moment uh, in, in uh, the polit political life of uh, political parties, including our own. Uh, because we, we were heading for national general elections, everybody wanting to be elected and lead the country. But uh, we are happy that reasoning prevailed over um, the edge of leading the nation in terms of uh, political parties. We prioritize this as a matter of principle, that it is time that we demonstrate our stance uh, on anti-corruption matters. And so the, 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 the work of the Zondo Commission is, is indeed commendable, and that of the PIC, and that other one that was committed, completed uh, on SARS, NPA, and also the forensic uh, investigations all over and the work of the Auditor General. And we think that, and the police, and the police, all divisions of police, they need to know we commend them. And those who are leading all these divisions, like you, Lieutenant General, we want you to, be, um, to feel very strong, and indeed to be very strong and brave and I think, among other things, that's why you are Lieutenant General. That's a very powerful position, Lieutenant General. And, and, and therefore, we must uh, feel safe that we are going to overcome our uh, problems and win this war against uh, corruption. But let me emphasize that a fight against corruption needs to be a fight against corruption. It can't be a massage <laughs> against corruption. And there's a difference. There's a difference. A fight is a fight. After all, some of these people who commit this gain their confidence from the way they organize themselves, the way they resource themselves, and the way they cause fear among all of us including high echelons of, uh, of the state. People get compromised easily because they fear that I'm being followed and so on and so on, even if they are not followed. But you just feel you are followed. You can't say this, you can't say that. Maybe if, even if you are a minister, you feel you are not safe enough and then you don't do the things that you are supposed to do. Let's give each other support. 
Let's make sure that even those who are less brave must be more brave, must be braver, braver, if there's something like that in English. And make sure that we take, we take on this particular important task. It has never been important like it is now to fight corruption and make sure that our country get rid of uh, the scorch of corruption. We therefore understand that we need resources, both in terms of uh, actual uh, money and, and personnel. Um, and these are, there are efforts to make, it, uh, to make those resources available. Maybe we may not make uh, uh, everything available as may be required, but whatever is provided, let's make maximal use of it and continue to make efforts to make sure that resources are available. Prosecutors are very important in the fight against uh, corruption. You are the ones who have to put together all the figures, all the stories of what happened when, and get all the papers in place, uh, working with the uh, police, working with uh, whistleblowers, and so on. And therefore, we, 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 we need to move on beyond positioning ourselves against this and make sure that we, we walk the talk. On the issue of whistleblowers, uh, there are various views. But the bottom line is that the role of whistleblowers is important in terms of reinforcing what police do in, in terms of their investigations. And we urge the uh, Department of Justice to make sure that they are given necessary um, safety and, and so on, and, and assisted uh, to do this particular important uh, task where they have to play a role. We acknowledge their, 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 their role and, and their importance. On our side, we will always uh, play our role. Uh, I came across uh, sitting in the benches of uh, Parliament last week, I got, came across one story about the Eastern Cape employing an official um, after five days after they had been uh, dismissed for corruption. I'm sure the story did rounds and they all saw it. We have written um, a letter to um, uh, Premier Mabuyan in the Eastern Cape to make him aware of the prescripts that uh, regulate employment of people in that category. We have already written that letter. We have also, we are busy making inquiries from the relevant department before, um, as was established, to say uh, all these, pro were these processes authentic and so on. But we, we felt that we needed to write a letter first, even though we're not sure about authenticity of uh, processes. But just to put it up front that if it is true that an official who had been uh, found guilty has been employed elsewhere, if it is true, it therefore can't be allowed. We made it very clear, it's not permissible and it's not going to happen. and we are therefore in the process of, of doing that. We have to call it a day on, on such things happening. So whether it's a municipality, whether it's a provincial department or a national department, or anywhere in the public sector, in the, in the SOEs for instance, we are going to be very decisive and almost confrontational where we need to be confrontational just to make sure that we mean what we're, what we're saying. And then we'll answer questions as we go, uh, but having acted. One of the things that we are conscious of is democracy. We're aware that we're a democratic, a democratic country. We're aware that we are nursing a young democracy and we need it uh, to grow in leaps and bounds. But we're aware of a number of things that are emerging as major challenges to our democracy. One of them, or rather the first one, is that registration figures are declining in the country. 
It's time we go, we prepare for a round of election, whether national or locally. What happens is that there's a decline in terms of registration figures. And there's a pointer. The second one is voter turnout. It's declining. Now, the third one is that younger people are getting more and more reluctant to be part of the electorate and to, and to vote and participate in, in uh, um, a democratic uh, processes of establishing governments in this. And then we, they, they, there's definitely a reason for this. And we need to delve into this, otherwise there's danger that governments that emerge from time to time after elections will become illegitimate if less and less numbers of people participate in, in, in elections. We are aware of this danger, but this is also happening amid lesser and lesser uh, 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 cases uh, of service delivery as, 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 as expected by the larger populace of our people. Service delivery is proving to be quite a challenge. Yes, on one hand, government is making efforts via various departments to improve on, on, on this, but it's also proving to be quite a challenge, I must say. Where you see load shedding while you are sitting with your family and enjoying whatever on TV, it's, it, it's a point that, that there is a challenge. And, and, and SAA is fighting, is, is, fly, is, fly, is, is, is uh, flying low uh, these days. Uh, so all of these are indicators that public service um, or, or service delivery is um, meeting uh, challenges that we are uh, uh, acting on in terms of uh, overcoming. But they talk to democracy, of course, uh, the nature of democracy in our country, and we are quite aware of this, and we are looking at, at, at those challenges and make, sh make sure that we overcome them. We, we, we are on 16 days, um, 16 days of efforts or heightened efforts um, against violence against women and children in, in our country. Of course, we are aware that over the last few years, we are seeing an increase in the scourge, violence against women. And it's part of a test to our democracy, strength of leadership and of government, and it's something that we are determined to, to overcome. And we are saying that as, as part of an effort uh, to make sure that our country gets rid of or rids itself of the negatives, we need to strengthen our efforts on fighting the scourge of violence against uh, women and, and our children. And we, make, we need to make sure that we join efforts and succeed. As I sit down, I just want to just say how far at times corruption goes just for for us to be aware and to tell the public out there that this is no theory. It's something that is actually happening and happening just under our noses. And hence the, the la la louder call to make sure that we actually sharpen our efforts against this. The stories out there that say, um, even at local government level, Corruption goes as far as uh, in, other, in other municipalities, denying people who are seen to be taking a stance against, local, uh, against corruption at local government level. It goes up to efforts to switch off their electricity and other services. So if you are a prominent member in your, in your community and you want to point at problems in your municipality, 
and then they, they, there would then be efforts to deal with you as an individual, even at a local government level. Switch off your electricity, don't pick up your waste, and so on and so on. Inside political parties, there are also uh, indications or, or trends that indicate that power is about to be on sale where people get into positions via a, a network of uh, uh, corrupt activities. Now, all of these are things that we should uh, uh, be ready uh, to look into. And, and therefore, it's no exaggeration. It's entering the whole of the societal fabric. And, and therefore, the net must be wider in terms of reading ourselves of any form of corruption. And finally, I just want to say we, in public service, we have a, a number of challenges that we, we are tackling. I'm not saying that these are, are activities of uh, corruption, but sometimes um, uh, we, we, we have to put them very close uh, to a different form of uh, uh, of uh, unwanted uh, or undesirable uh, 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 practices. There is, a, um, there is an effort, therefore, on our side to make sure we deal, one, with uh, leaks in the, in the fiscus via a number of things that are happening. There is a group of uh, ministers that we are chairing that were looking squarely on this. These may not necessarily be outright corruption, because they've been officialized, but we know that they constitute unwanted or undesirable practices. There are quite a number of them that we're dealing with, either on buildings or litigations that we can avoid, and a number of other practices, wasteful expenditure, um, irregular, irregular um, expenditure. All of those, when you look into them deeply, they definitely speak to some of the things that we should cease to do. And to assist at this particular point in time to deal with, with each one of them as we have identified, including some form of tendering and so on. We want to rehabilitate the state as far as these ones are concerned, so that we can free more money uh, to services. But the second category of this is um, the frills, or rather call them um, um, privileges that the executive of this, of this country have been enjoying for quite some time um, via what is called the ministerial handbook. We have undertaken uh, to, to, to make a review on this, and we have done that. And the president, we are very happy that the president has assigned the new, it's no longer the new old, it is the new <laughs> ministerial handbook. We spent quite a lot of time on this, and among them, one of the main features, or some of the main features, is that ministers. Um, MSCs, premiers are no longer expected to fly business class. They must fly economy. This is done both as, um, as, as, as an, observ as an obs observation of the real issues on our economy and the fiscus, but also to begin to shape our own outlook at the executive and how the executive need to carry themselves and behave uh, in a country like South Africa. Very often countries from, I mean, outside countries, when you fly into South Africa, particularly at night or early in the morning, you prepare to land at OR, you see a sea of lights and you say, South Africa is just like London, it's not. It's not. Beyond the lights that you see when you land, there is a 
total, total contrast of what you see as you land. It's totally dark and there's mud and people there are really struggling with uh, uh, life and life conditions. And therefore, we have to adapt and, f and free other resources to cater for the needs of uh, uh, many people out there uh, and so on. So that's, that's one of the features. There was uh, this issue of when you get appointed as minister, you then um, you have an allowance of uh, 100,000 rand to do your security uh, security upgrades, and it was upgraded also to 250,000. Now, um, that has been done away with. Uh, it has not been reduced. It has been done away with. It's zero now. That's where we stand. So, if you are a minister and you get appointed, uh, you now have to sort out your own security um, and, and, and look at that and so on. So there are quite a number of uh, these, these areas uh, that have been reviewed totally. It's no populism of any kind. It's just dealing honestly and directly with uh, what we need to deal with in the ministerial handbook. So we're saying the executive um, is being called upon to make certain sacrifices so that um, we really uh, uh, tackle what we need to tackle, at, uh, all of us together. Um, so there, there, there is that package of uh, uh, sacrifices by the executive, from national to province and to local. So the mayor, the mayors, and ESCOs are part of that. Deputy ministers, and by now we expect that Treasury should have signed a secular that will also go to top officials like um, directors general, um, DDGs, so that as ministers we don't go through business to go to economy and we leave our DGs <laughs> to, fly, <laughs> to fly business class. Um, it can't happen that way. We all have to commute. We all have to move to the uh, to the other side of. Uh, um. But the third one that we were dealing with is uh, the um, the wage bill, uh, which we are aware is a source of concern uh, to the public. We are not looking on. We are dealing with that particular matter. All we want to say uh, is that it is not necessarily in numbers. It is on the wage bill itself. That was determined beyond any doubt. Um, and, and, and via a number of uh, studies that we've, we've made. In 2006, 2007, our wage bill stood at something like 200, just, just more than 200 billion rand. And, and later on, 18, 19, it stands at more than 500 billion. And now, obviously, that's where the problem lies. It doesn't lie on numbers, because the numbers have grown just by I mean, in 2067, we, we public servants were around 1.1 um, million, and now they are 1.2 million plus when we did uh, the studies in 18, 19. And therefore, we are sure that it doesn't lie uh, on numbers necessarily. Of course, we've got to look at SOEs, we've got to look at uh, contract workers, uh, and so on. And we'll look at local government as well, but at, at the moment, public servants in, in permanent positions at provincial and national levels, they stand there. We can't look on on these matters um, because they constitute recklessness on the side if they are not dealt with. And they can drive us and call the whole democratic house of South Africa that we so love fall on our heads. And therefore, we have to mitigate against those. So understand us to persist with this and, and engaging the necessary um, um, affected uh, people um, and dealing with all this range of, of, of matters. I thought I should uh, make comments on those so that you understand us uh, to be involved and very busy in terms of rehabilitating uh, our state machinery and how 
government as a whole need to function and shape itself uh, in, uh, accordingly in terms of our expectations. We'll go on with the fight on, on ethics and on, um, on uh, the quality of services, but plus on professionalism. We are talking very hard to our public servants. The corner of the day is when you have to treat people like uh, nuisance in, in, in your desk. You are at lunch. When you come back from lunch, you are in a long conversation with your friend. People are waiting here. You are talking about what happened and didn't, didn't happen during the weekend. Um, how you slept, uh, what is troubling you, wherever, all those things. Once you get in at eight, pack all your personal issues. Deal with uh, the people and service them. When you knock out, then open your back and deal with all, with all your personal things as you go back home, whatever they are. We are determined and we are sure that we are going to overcome all our challenges. Thank you very much. Wow. You heard it, folks. Let's put our hands together again. I'm looking forward to that day when uh, the ministers, the DGs, will cross that curtain in a plane to come this side, where we will whisper to them that, do you know that in my village, water has not been running? <clears throat> So petitions will be delivered directly. <laughs> uh, they better talk to the airlines to sort of stretch the seats a little bit because the leg room <clears throat> and the hips are squeezing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cutlery that side is silver. This side is plastic. <clears throat> but uh, I think with time, things will happen. Uh, this was wonderful news because the country has been praying, saying our executive can't live a life as if we're not going through a crisis. So now we are together. There'll be solidarity behind the curtain. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you see, on the other side, you receive a newspaper, there is a warm towel. You are asked before the plane takes off to take some juices. <clears throat> on the other side, you can't take a nap. You're waiting for the sound of a trolley to come <laughs> because you'll, you'll die of hunger. <clears throat> so... Now we are moving, as you see, the next performance that we're going to see with the signing of the pledge. But as we prepare for that, do you know that Finland has just elected the youngest prime minister at age 33, and she's a woman? Let's put our hands together. From tomorrow. So from tomorrow you'll have this dynamic young person. I don't know how we just become ageist and skeptical about young people because even people who say they are Christians. Do you know that uh, it is said that uh, when Jesus Christ was nailed, he was 33 years. So for all the work he did, it was done before 33 years. Do you know that Steve Biko was, what, 31 years? So things can be done. You don't need to take people from working with their grandchildren, homework, <laughs> to suffocate the space. <laughs> Where they start telling many stories. <clears throat> you see? Now it's going to be lit with this new announcement minister. 
The other one is the efficiency. If we can just stop those delegations from South Africa, people Google themselves and invite themselves into international conferences. <laughs> South Africa has the biggest delegations. And once they come in, they attend the gala dinner the first day. After that, they disappear into the malls. So if we can just close that tap. Now we are going to have the signing of the pledge. We will have the projection here where we will read along. But uh, ultimately, it will be signed. And I do want us to put our eyes on the projector because it's for all of us, not the leaders. I'm worried that the business sector is not well represented in the House. Is it now? <coughs> Thank you very much because uh, they are the other side in this collaborative effort in corrupt activities. The, the politics, the business, and some civil society, it has gone even to churches now. Uh, <clears throat> I think the whole world is a crime scene. It should just be rounded with police ribbon. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we will be reading. Uh, who will lead the reading? Uh, let me have the tools for reading. Uh, if you can. I read not because I'm the primary suspect. It's for all of us. <laughs> it's for all of us. <laughs> uh, if we can... In fact, I would even say, uh, let's start reading. You'll follow after me. My anti-corruption pledge. My anti-corruption pledge. I pledge to be a responsible and honest citizen. I pledge to be a responsible and honest citizen. Neither pay nor take bribes. Obey the law and encourage others around me to do the same. To treat public resources respectfully. Never abuse any money entrusted to my care or position. Act with integrity in all my dealings. In thought and action. And always act in the best interest of our country. I would even add our world. Uh, we will now ask the designated leaders to come and sign the pledge as we sit down. This is a symbolic commitment. And uh, the pens for signing, I guess, they are there. So we will ask the minister, we'll ask advocate, we'll ask uh, our UN rep, Dr. Sotlikwa, and uh, the people who are in the program including Professor Tulima Donzella, you know that uh, she will forever remain synonymous with epic battles that have brought us into the situation of talking state capture.
<laughs> That's Robert McBride, the one and only. <laughs> uh, good people, this solemn occasion is to remind the occasion was when you have any temptation, uh, you'll remember all this. As we move on with the program, I just want to say, Minister, for that person who was found guilty, expelled, then came back to work, people should not take the country for a fool. You can only recycle old plastic, <laughs> not public servants who have done wrong. So <clears throat> the recycling is only doing that. <clears throat> Now we're going to ask the Katrada Foundation and uh, to read the memo on behalf of the NGOs which presented the petition. If we can have the designated person so that we can also hear the voice of uh, the NGOs. As we do that, the youngest MPL also who will be taking over the chairing of the session after this short one is here. She was the leader of the Fees Must Fall, Hassan. Uh, I think she has just stepped outside. She's the youngest MPL in Gauteng. We are indeed making the right moves. I'll now invite the person on behalf of the Katrada Foundation to read the petition. Uh, please join us. Let's put our hands together. Morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Abrams, and I'm here on behalf of the Umid Katrada Foundation. But I'll be reading the memorandum on behalf of a number of civil society organizations who have endorsed it. We, the undersigned organizations, on International Anti-Corruption Day, reiterate our commitment to defeating state capture and rebuilding the state. Over the last few years, we have been actively involved in taking a decisive stance against the capture of our state, opposing the brazen looting of our fiscus, exposing and speaking out against the manipulation of our political and criminal justice systems, and demanding an end to unethical and inefficient governance. Failures in this regard by the state, political parties, business, labor, and in part society itself have diverted the program of transformation that our country was meant to pursue to uplift the marginalized. It shifted resources from those who desperately needed them towards a rent-seeking and greedy elite. It has undermined our democracy and its processes and has been central to the near collapse of our economy. State capture has made our people suffer. The United Against Corruption gathering is being hosted here today by the Public Service Commission, the United Nations, and the University of South Africa. It draws in a range of speakers who occupy senior positions within the state, including from the criminal justice systems. Its audience is likely to include many from within civil society, from business, labor, and the faith-based sector. In essence, it provides a unique opportunity that has the potential to show broad societal and state commitment to truly tackling state capture and rebuilding the state, as well as confronting the state capture fight back that seeks to undermine the gains we have made so far in dealing with the problem. In July 2019, some 30 civil society organizations put their names to a document calling for the revival of broad fronts which helped us achieve key victories in the fight against state capture over the last few years. This conference is one of several initiatives that has the potential to support and promote the idea of developing joint platforms to work on common causes in relation to defeating state capture and rebuilding the state. It is within this context that we call on this conference to, one, acknowledge some of the work done by the criminal justice system in 2019, indicating that there is a forward movement in tackling state ca capture and corruption. Two, 
highlight that there is a growing public impatience about the, work at, about the pace at which work is being done to defeat state capture and bring those implicated in it to account. There is an urgency to finalize cases and begin the prosecution process. Three, ensure that government begins looking at a coherent and comprehensive response to not only corruption in general, but state capture specifically and in its entirety. This plan should include all role players, both within state institutions and those in civil society, business and labor in rallying against state capture. And four, put pressure on government to conclude its extradition treaties and agreements with countries, including the United Arab Emirates and India, to bring the Guptas and the associates implicated in state capture back to South Africa to be held accountable here. On International Anti-Corruption Day, we urge this conference to not only discuss the problems arising from state capture, we want you to commit to taking action, not only on issues related to past corruption and capture, but also by identifying what urgently needs to be done to prevent current and future instances of capture. We do not want this conference to be a talk shop. We think it is time to walk the talk. In doing so, we will support your efforts but will also maintain a critical outlook where there are failures and lack of progress. At a recent civil society conference against state capture, organizations affirmed that they will continue adv advocating for an ethical and efficient constitutional democracy in which the interest of the people is put first. We have committed to strengthening democracy, defeating state capture, and rebuilding our country. We hope that this is a commitment that you share and pledge to honor. Endorsed by the Active Citizens Movement, the Ahmed Katrada Foundation, the Orwell Socioeconomic Research Institute, Botsotso, the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, the Congress of Business and Economics, the Council for the Advancement of the South African Institution, the Federation of Unions of South Africa, Freedom Under Law, Forensics for Justice, the Greater Mayfair Civic Association, the Helen Sussman Foundation, the Jamea Tool Ulama South Africa, Johannesburg Injustice, Against Injustice, Lawyers for Human Rights, the Legal Resources Center, Marikana Support Campaign, Muir Bank Justice Network, Organization Undoing Tax Abuse, Patriotic Movement, Pakama Whistleblowing Coalition, Peace Center Cape Town, the Public Affairs Research Institute, the Right to Know Campaign, Studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute, the South African Council of Churches, the South African Tamil Federation, the Chisimani Center for Activist Education, and United Civics of Ward 58. Thank you. Thank you very much. The people have spoken, the civil society is part of the effort and part of the formal program because we ought to tackle this problem from all sides. Now we're moving just with two speakers, then we have a tea break. Oh, I think uh, that there is one more announcement. I'm hoping that the minister is going to remove more packs as he <laughs> He might have forgotten one more. <laughs> No, thank you very much. Just briefly uh, to just take a minute and uh, acknowledge receipt of this memorandum. We, we do have it. We have received it from uh, Advocate Sizani. It is as it was right here. And we will, uh, uh, of course, uh, attend to it and respond. It's a decent and, and courageous move from ordinary people who have organized themselves, their time, their resources as civil society to challenge whatever they see is a challenge and take a stand. It's something that we identify with. As government, we do accept that we have to be challenged. We have to stand on our toes. We have to listen. And, and, and of course, um, mobilize all of us uh, to act accordingly. So we say to all these organizations that are here, you are acknowledged and thank you very much.
this is the sign of things to come where government, civil society, business sit together, acknowledge, complement each other, rather than to say, put the security, block them, block them. And now here, people are fighting the same thing. I was watching some of the senior civil servants to see if uh, under their shirt, their heart was not, uh, you know, skipping a bit <laughs> about another announcement by the minister taking the perks. <laughs> <laughs> then when he started acknowledging, and I saw the calmness, uh, you know, it was more like they were meditating, uh, you know, the decision. <laughs> now as we move forward into our next speakers, I just want to say, Father Mkachwa, on a day like this one, I am reminded of this person who was corrupt and uh, terrorizing villages in Mexico. Then he was sick in hospital. He had killed so many, he uh, was stealing a drug lord. Then the priest came to pray for him in the hospital. Then he said, before I pray, can you denounce, uh, you know, all the evil things you have done? And he said, under these circumstances, I can no longer afford to make any more enemy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he declined denouncing because he could no longer know what was wrong and what was right. As we now call upon uh, the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption and the International Anti-Corruption Day, the person who is going to speak there is Mr. Mongale. Let's put our hands together. He's the National Project Officer. <laughs> Whilst we're clapping, if you misplaced your Audi keys, they have been brought forward. So many things have been brought forward in the spirit of anti-corruption. <laughs> no one is going <clears> to... <throat> Thank you, Program Director, Minister for Public Service and Administration, Honorable Senzom Tunu, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa, Dr. Marcia Sotikwa, United Nations Resident Coordinator, Ms. Begele Thomas, Chairperson of the Public Service Commission, Advocate Richard Zizani, and all Commissioners of the Public Service Commission, heads of law enforcement agencies, the prosecution authority, and all heads of government departments, representatives of civil society organizations and private sector, representatives of the diplomatic corps, members of the academia, fellow speakers and panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I salute you. I deliver this speech on behalf of Ms. Zuldich Akishiva, the Regional Representative of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, Regional Office for Southern Africa. By observing the International Anti-Corruption Day, the government of South Africa joins other nations of the world in reaffirming its commitment to addressing the enormous problem of corruption, which is generally acknowledged by government and widely reported across the board. Now what is very critical as we commemorate this important day, we have to go back and remember that South Africa ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption in November 2004, taking a massive commitment to tackle the scourge of corruption. And by 2007, South Africa had put in place a very strong, solid legislative and institutional framework to deal effectively with corruption in all sectors of society. The question that we need to ask is, has the country utilized this framework to eradicate the problem of corruption that we find in our society? But if you look at the amount of evidence emanating from the commissions of inquiry, which reveals that the framework could have not yielded the results that we so much wanted to see. For we can even see and read from 
the newspaper that, uh, as a country, South Africa continues to grapple with the problem of corruption. The scourge has practically set back the gains of democracy achieved after 1994 and stalled many developmental programs. A country that became a beacon of hope for many in the African continent and around the world finds itself burdened by the heavy weight of poverty, high levels of unemployment, crime, and faltering economy. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, tackling corruption is necessary for creating a conducive environment for achieving the sustainable developmental goals, thereby building a better life for the future generation. We at the UNODC support the ideals of building an effective government which has the capacity to deliver the necessary infrastructure and providing the essential service, services. We believe in the National Development Plan vision of 2030 of the government of South Africa to build a society that has zero tolerance for corruption and where anti-corruption agencies have the resources, independence, and powers to tackle corruption effectively. Now, as a result of ratifying the convention in 2004, South Africa continues to take active participation in the implementation review mechanism of the UN Convention Against Corruption. And in 2012, the country completed the first review cycle of the convention, which entailed the review of chapter three that deals with criminalization, and chapter four that deals with international cooperation. So as a result of the ratification of the convention, we have to every time then take stock whether we as the country are implementing the provisions of the UN Convention Against Corruption. And this is what the review has revealed. The review that was un undertaken with the involvement of both civil society and the business sector. And it revealed some significant successes regarding the implementation of the convention. And if I could just cite maybe two examples, the witness protection program within the NPA, Advocate Batoi, was lauded as the best example uh, of successes. The conviction-based and non-conviction-based uh, for feature system was lauded as well. But the review also highlighted some several changes that made a number, that resulted in a number of recommendations. And the report is available and is accessible through the UNODC website. And you can always uh, access this uh, report from our office. And you will, if you go through this report, you will see that there are a number of challenges that were highlighted and there were recommendations that were made to be able to meet these challenges. And just to give you a snapshot of these recommendations that were made as a result of this review. Number one, consider adopting legislation to make passive bribery of foreign public official a criminal offense under section five of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. Now, a number of activities were undertaken, but if you look at this recommendation in its entirety, you will realize that um, it has not been implemented simply because the amendments of PRACA is yet to be finalized. The second recommendation, consider the adoption of further procedures to disqualify for a period of time persons convicted of convention offenses from holding public office or holding office in, a, in public enterprise. Again, if you look at the current situation, there are no procedures that have been adopted yet to deal with this recommendation. The third recommendation, consider the development and adoption of legislative or other measures to criminalize the abuse of functions by public officials. Again, this recommendation is not yet fully implemented. Continue to develop guidelines for implementation of Section 23 of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act to address su suspected cases of illicit enrichment. Again, there's been efforts to develop a lifestyle audit framework uh, for government officials, but again, the framework is yet to be adopted. So again, the recommendation has not been fully uh, implemented. And finally, Review the anti-corruption strategy and action plan 
to strengthen implementation and operationalization of anti-corruption laws and institutions in partnership with civil society and the business sector. And I think uh, after I've delivered this speech, uh, Mr. Robert McBride and uh, Mr. David Lewis will come after me and they will give us a status about the development of the strategy, which will prove evidence to what I have highlighted that these recommendations are yet to be achieved. So the strategy, a lot of efforts have been put in there, but the, the strategy has not been uh, developed. So we as the UNODC are ready to provide support to the government of South Africa to make sure that all these recommendations are implemented. And at this point, Program Director, I would like to take the opportunity to read uh, to this uh, gathering the statement on International Decryption Day that was made by the Executive Director of the UNODC, Mr. Yuri Fedotov. And the statement reads like this. Corruption affects people in their daily lives. It bars them from accessing resources and opportunities. It erodes trust in public institutions and compromises the social contract. In doing so, corruption thwarts our attempts at building a better world. As we enter a decade of ambitious action to achieve the sustainable development goals on time, stepping up efforts to eradicate corruption and promote good governance is essential if we are to deliver on our global pledge to leave no one behind. To win the fight against corruption is to create the conditions necessary to effectively combat poverty and the inequalities that stems from it. Ladies and gentlemen, notable progress has been made in the past 15 years on the criminalization of corruption and the recovery and return of stolen assets. And thanks to the almost universally ratified UN Convention Against Corruption, for 10 years now, implementation of the convention has benefited from a unique peer review mechanism that I have uh, indicated earlier on, serving as a trigger for countries to launch legislative action and strengthen their institutions and increase cooperation. The UNODC helps the international community to translate the convention into effective action and advance the global anti-corruption agenda. An important part of this is assisting preparation for the first ever UN General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption in 2021. In building inclusive momentum for this key occasion, we have to listen to the voices of young people who are demanding transparency and moving the dial by taking action in their communities. We must capture the full potential of innovation in the fight against corruption, harnessing technology for monitoring, reporting, raising awareness and countering those who exploit it to enable their crimes. We cannot afford to let corruption threaten our future. Standing united against corruption, we are standing up for justice, protecting the rule of law and increasing the chances that prosperity in our society can be enjoyed by all. And in line with the theme of the 2019 International Anti-Corruption Day, United Against Corruption, we can foster a culture of lawfulness we can help build accountable and transparent institutions and enable people everywhere to access opportunity and live healthy and productive lives. United, we can galvanize the youth and empower them on the value of living ethically. We can create an environment where the rule of law prevails and refuse to participate in any activities that are not legal and transparent. We can report, the relevant, we can report to relevant bodies incidents of corruption we can build partnership and enhance cooperation of private sector, civil society, academia, the youth, and the general public, which is fundamental for the fight against corruption. All these relevant st stakeholders are key for the exchange of knowledge, data, and best practices to enable comprehensive discussion for the advancement of the implementation of the convention and the sustainable development goals. I thank you, Program Director. Thank you, nice and short, mindful of the time. We started almost an hour late, but we're trying to recover. So it's a signal to our next speakers. But at the same time, I appreciate your patience because corrupt people are working overtime. <laughs> At night, they are, there, they are in the basements now doing cybercrime, everything. 
so we can't afford not to have time to talk about them and to plan action. Earlier on, I had said there is a youth who crafted a video which won a prize, and that is Tutu Kanindunge. He was not around at the time, but I want him to show up if he is or she is around. If not, oh, she's there. E Kamala Makoskazi. E Kamala Makoskazi. Congratulations again, you're making us proud as we move on to our next two speakers. When people were signing here, you might have noticed that I delayed going there. I noticed that every right-handed person was signing, and I realized that left-handed people like me could just be accused as the ones who didn't <laughs> sign the pledge. So I went to sign on behalf of the left-handed people as well. <laughs> So now we will call upon a person who needs no introduction, uh, Mr. Robert McBride, reflecting on the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. He is the co-chair of uh, the National Anti-Corruption uh, Strategy Reference Group. Let's put our hands together for Robert McBride. We would have put the speakers in front, but we realized that this hall is fuller than the previous years. So we couldn't recycle people. Uh, that's why we have decided just to maintain the order. Thanks, Honorable Program Director. Thank you, Honorable Minister. The leadership of the UNISA, the whole of society represented here, committed to the fight against corruption. The national anti-corruption strategy is meant to mobilize the whole of society, including NGOs, business, the state against corruption. And in the process is to get um, total buy-in from all sides in the mobilization. So we, and it's coming from the members of the reference group in terms of the update, as a result of the support from our steering committee and the participation of the reference group with inputs from various stakeholders, we can safely say that we have made more progress in the last four months that was then that it was made from 2016. Um, and that shows you the seriousness with which people are taking the task. We've given ourselves a date, which we might overlap, of the 30th of, um, of March to hand in to the minister and cabinet the completed and accepted and endorsed um, national strategy against corruption, uh, national anti-corruption strategy. So we've... <coughs> Um, we are on track. We, one of the key issues is how do we deal with the different components within law enforcement, those that are not in law enforcement, how do we coordinate, act in unison, and act with tenacity of purpose, um, and ensure that nothing falls between the cracks. Uh, one of our motivations, of course, is that much of the organizations that will be involved in the anti-corruption drive and the implementation were in existence all along, even during the state capture period. But they were not given the right directions. They were repurposed for wrong issues. And how do we ensure that that never occurs again? And that's what we are intending to do. So organizations will be invited um, to make presentations to the, the reference group at, at its meetings to indicate where they fit in, how they in, evolve, and the role that they see that they play, and where we require, as Etumaleng wa, was speaking earlier on behalf of the UN, additional legislation or regulations that we must make that 
clear and where there's weaknesses or hesitation um, based on inadequate legislation that we should then correct that so that we can then take it forward so no loopholes are available. So in short, with the, um, we've also had a recent conference um, under the UNODC in Livingston dealing with uh, ex expeditious implementation of the UNCAC in Southern Africa. And a number of the resolutions taken there fit in with what uh, our discussions in the reference group entail. So we see we are on the right track and it's the whole of the world is moving. A fear created unnecessarily is about the lifestyle audits that must come. And in other countries on the continent, they have lifestyle audit acts. So there's no escaping from it. So it's there, and if you're a civil servant, you're a servant of the people, expect to be subjected to scrutiny in your lifestyle audits and the way you run your business and your life. It's because you are serving the people. I'll, I'll just stop there, I know this time. Thank you. Now let's uh, put our hands together for Mr. Lewis. Thank you, thank you, uh, comrades. You know, we've been uh, reminded by a number of speakers today how important this day is, but I think uh, we've forgotten how really important this day is for South Africans. It was uh, four years ago on this very day that Ntlantla Nene was summarily dismissed as Minister of Finance and replaced by the weekend special <laughs> on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a day on a day that for many marked the beginning of the end of the corrupt Zuma administration. So apart from the fact that this is World Anti-Corruption Day, it's a particularly important day, I think, in the, in the history of South Africa. And, and you know, since then, I've been to this gathering uh, on a number of occasions, most occasions on which it's been held. You know, I've, I've been on this podium uh, sometimes with, uh, with, with ministers and leading public servants who themselves were suspected of fairly uh, 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 gross acts of, uh, of corruption. And, um, and uh, hearing them commit to uh, uh, a program against corruption, to fighting corruption, when uh, number one, now better known as accused number one, was in the union buildings at the time. And at that time, I remember also in 2017, uh, talking here when uh, uh, General Intlemeza was sitting in the same seat as uh, Advocate Motibi, <laughs> glaring at me in that warm and friendly way that he, he had, and really thinking at the time, you know, what is a nice guy like me doing in a place like this? <laughs> and. Um, and I'm, pre and I'm pleased to say that I don't feel those sorts of qualms anymore. I think much has happened in the last two years, and important strides have been made in dealing with, with corruption. Uh, several particularly corrupt cabinet ministers were fired. Uh, we have new heads of SARS, the NPA, the Hawks, leaders of in integrity and competence, we have the S many SOE boards replaced. Um, we have the special unit set up in the, in the NPA and we have the tribunal set up in the SIU. Th these are all extremely important developments and for anyone who has experienced how slowly the wheels of government sometimes turn, to have accomplished this and much more in those two years is a, is a signal achievement. But for me, you know, what the most important thing is about the change in the regime is the extent to which um, the, the government is willing to engage and work with uh, civil society. And, you know, we've seen that from Corruption Watch's perspective in a number of ish events. The National Anti-Corruption Health Forum 
set up by the SIU or chaired by the SIU is one really strong example of a working relationship. These are not sort of grandstanding meetings. They're meetings in which civil society and the law enforcement agencies and government departments and other government agencies work at tackling corruption in the health care system. And we've seen it in the, in the pre development of the national anti-corruption strategy. I mean, there again, we have a real working group. And though some of my civil society uh, comrades may not want to hear it, it's sometimes difficult to tell who's from government and who's from civil society. There's a real joint effort to uh, engage with developing a strategy and policy to tackle uh, corruption. But we, we know that there is still an enormous amount to be done. We, I think, now know how severely damaged uh, many of the institutions of state were during the era of state capture and how we, and I mean we collectively, have to work to rebuild those institutions. We in civil society know how incredibly impatient and understandably impatient the public are to see prosecutions. Um, and as much as government is now listening to civil society um, more keenly than they have ever done in the, in the past, uh, they have to listen even more carefully. Uh, there's no doubt about it that if government were listening carefully to civil society, they would have not signed the traditional Khoisan leadership bill into law. Equally, we would not be seeing in sitting in Parliament many MPs, some of whom are, uh, are, 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 are chairing important committees who should not be in Parliament. In fact, m some of whom who should not be walking around free. And, um, and, 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 and government have to acknowledge, and I think, uh, you know, maybe I put words into his, heart, into his mouth, I heard the minister effectively acknowledge this, that civil society have a strong connection with ordinary people, that I'm afraid our electoral system denies uh, our parliamentarians very, very, very often. So we are, we are close to the people and our views need to be taken seriously, not because we as civil society leaders are important, but because in our work, we do engage closely with, uh, with people. And so our voice has come into the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, and I hope that, uh, that, that you will see it when the strategy is, is, is eventually released. Uh, Robert outlined the, uh, the, the program for that, and, uh, and this hopefully will be submitted uh, at various gatherings, and I hope around the country, um, from the end of March next year. And that's when the really hard work starts. There has to be government buy-in to the strategy. At the very highest level, this has to be the president's strategy, the one that he owns and takes account for and is held accountable to. There has to be public buy-in. Uh, you know, the, 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 the main bones of the strategy, the main flesh of the strategy was actually prepared quite a long time ago, but there has been a very ineffective uh, campaign that many of you would not even have noticed to achieve public buy-in, and that has to change. And for that, civil society organizations, again, are going to be needed and are going to be important. And those who have developed the strategy, including those from civil society, may not always like what civil society says, but that's what they are there for. And so I hope that by the time we come to this gathering next year, that uh, we will have on the table and before us a series of commitments made by government and indeed commitments made by civil society that we hope we will be able to discuss. So it will be the end of saying what we should be doing to tackle corruption and we will have in front of us a roadmap and a series of policies and proposals that are precisely aimed at, at doing that. And I really look forward to that, and I look forward to an even larger and higher delegation from uh, government here at this meeting, where I hope uh, 
this is the kind of gathering in the National Anti-Corruption Forum when it gets established that really has to be owned by the president of the country and the whole of the uh, senior executive. And let's hope that, uh, as I say, next year this time we have that sort of buy-in from government and from the whole of the country. So thank you, and I think you have something to look forward to. What a morning, what a session. Let's put our hands together again for Mr. Lewis. The benefits of democracy is that an NGO and the minister sit next to each other. They tell each other like it is. They go have tea, they come back, and there's nothing happening. <laughs> Unlike other places where once you have spoken like this, and an accident is arranged uh, <coughs> to terminate you. <coughs> so, as we bring this session to a close, I'm reminded with all the challenges that we're facing of what Martin Luther King Jr. once said in his I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Even though we may face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is that hope that we must have, as we say all hands on the deck, if not you, who will do it? If not now, when will it be done? And uh, if not here, where will it be done? So with those words, you've been such a wonderful audience as we, I would like to say thank you, Kia Leboha, Danki, Ndoribua, Oma Segna Lebo. Um, merci beaucoup, muchos gracias, everything else. Uh, you've been a wonderful, dignified audience. As we hand over to the youngest MPL, who was a prominent feature and the leader of Fees Must Fall, Sahiha Hassan, who will be chairing the next session. Uh, I hope you'll do the same for her. The tea break, we shorten it to 15 minutes. We still have heavy weights coming. It doesn't get any better if I'm holding Professor Tulima Donsela, uh, you know, to, to, to give her presentation. You might even get some nuggets from the state uh, of capture uh, <clears throat> if you hang around. So thank you very much. the keys for the car in the spirit of anti-corruption.
Yeah, you can leave it. Then your car, AG, the space is okay for AG. So you will introduce the bricks, whatever, whatever yes, I will say the lead. It indicates that the number one category, the producer, is in Russia. Producers. Thank you everyone. Uh, I just ask that we all settle down so that we can begin uh, the afternoon session for today. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Fasia Hassan. Uh, I'm very honored and very humbled to have been asked to uh, facilitate this particular session. Uh, I'm very lucky also to be the youngest uh, member of the provincial legislature in Gauteng. I recently just turned 26, but I still am amongst the youngest. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to be having a very interesting discussion, and I'll bring it in a bit later. Um, but before we begin, I'm sure everybody has seen on their phones uh, the passing of our veteran, uh, Professor Ben Turok. And so, unfortunately, we're going to begin the session actually with a moment of silence. Uh, to honor Professor Turok, who we know was not just a veteran of our struggle, uh, but of somebody who, who displayed, I think, stellar leadership uh, in, in, in pushing for integrity. I mean, I've been informed that he was the last sitting chairperson of the Integrity Committee in Parliament. Um, and so let's just take a moment of silence together to honor Professor, a comrade, a veteran, and a leader. Yeah, if we could all stand, I think that would be most appropriate. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's only apt uh, that today of his passing, we should be here discussing um, an anti-corruption strategy. So let's ensure that in all of our discussions today, it not be in vain, given the fact, and we know this, that people dedicated their entire lives and everything that they had for this democracy. Um, and really, it's now at our hands to ensure that we, we not just build it up, but we safeguard it from those who seek to break it down. Uh, just before we enter into our panel discussion, we've got a very interesting uh, video. Uh, the BRICS member countries had established a working group on anti-corruption cooperation. And this project, this is what's exciting, um, has involved young people between 14 and 35 years of age designing a poster or developing a video to raise awareness and express their attitudes towards corruption. It's what you've been seeing that's been playing on the presentation throughout the day. The project also presents an opportunity to raise awareness amongst the youth and mobilize them against corruption. In terms of the project guidelines provided by the Russian Federation, uh, participating countries should select 10 posters and 10 videos which will be used for display during the final award ceremony in Moscow, Russia. South Africa received 47 entries for the poster and 13 videos, making a total of 60 entries. 
The 10 best videos and posters uh, have been shortlisted or were shortlisted for the semi-finals and are to be submitted to the international jury for display during the final award ceremony that's going to be taking a place on or around today uh, in Moscow, Russia. And the winners of the first place from both categories have advanced uh, to the finals, that's the international chapter in Moscow, Russia, where the overall winners of the contest will be announced in first, second, and third place. So now we're going to view a video of the winner uh, of the first place in the video category. And I just want to note that this current producer, he may not be with us, but he's actually already uh, in Moscow, Russia, representing South Africa in terms of anti-corruption. So let's, let's take a look at the video and then we can delve straight into our content. is the very plague that impoverishes the masses. The elect are chosen leaders, servicemen and women, as well as businesses at the helm, responsible for the degradation of the land and our economy, are to blame for their crimes. Robbing society in broad daylight, great suffrage, we the people, in building the job. As we youth, we believe that corruption is a part of our society, a problem that cannot be solved, but we are still mistaken. To fight this, we need to establish and execute conventions that are set up by global organizations, restoring faith and confidence in the people with power. However, this doesn't always happen because we are educated. Thus, knowledge and the power that these global organizations possess should be shared and learned to stand as a cornerstone for electing citizens into power who will thus carry out their duty in society while being fair and equal. With that said, whistleblowing should be taken seriously should be set in place to protect you when you report an illegal activity. This creates an atmosphere where the rule of law and justice will stand the test of time. We need to bring obstacles that deprive us of economic and societal freedom to ensure a future where we all can achieve our dreams by taking a stand against corruption together. It all starts with you. I think what's incredible is to see the quality of work coming out of South African youth. I think often uh, we don't acknowledge just how well young people can do, uh, given the opportunity. So I think this is absolutely incredible, and I think we should do another round of applause for South African youth excellence. Right, we, we wish them all the luck. Perhaps we'll, we'll be lucky enough to bring home the uh, actual prize from the BRICS the BRICS anti-corruption uh, uh, event that's happening in Russia. Um, just before I call up our different panelists, I think there's just something important for me to say. You know, as a young person, and I know there are young people in the room, we grew up in this democratic state, but not necessarily in the same way many others. I think there's a lot of distrust. There's a different kind of interaction with the new world or democracy. There's a lot more of us being unable to just trust what people say. Okay, we're gonna do this. You know, we don't really have this feeling of, okay, it's gonna be done. Um, and I think that's important to note because we're starting to enter into the working world. We're part of the so-called born free generation. And really you're starting to see a change in dynamics. It might be a bit slow, I think it is a bit slow, but you're starting to see that there's a change in how South Africans, I think, are starting to interact. Um, and Minister, you spoke about it, about this reluctance of particularly young people to vote, and particularly young people who are losing or being disillusioned with the system. And it can't be that we're so young and we're already giving up. Um, and I say this because the people sitting to my left, the people in this room, we have the power to change that. We are decision makers, we are policy makers, we sit in positions that allow for us to actually implement what we talk about. You know, it doesn't have to be a talk shop. The people here have the power to change things. Um, and that's really what's gonna be the theme of kind of the questions I'm gonna be asking and I'm hoping we're gonna go into Q&A, so let's stick to time. I really wanna do Q&A with the audience. Um, but that's really kind of what I want us to, to think about and to talk about because there's this general lack of public trust of even commissions. I mean, we spoke about some commissions, but do the public really trust uh, the outcome of these commissions? So. Uh, let me now first welcome up our, our very, very first speaker. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant General Godfrey Libia. He's the head of the Directorate for Priority Crimes Investigation. We know them as the Hawks. 
Um, he's also the former head of the detective services and the former deputy national commissioner of the police. He has over 30 years experience in the police service, so like more experience than I've been alive. <laughs> so serious experience. He is an admitted advocate uh, and he has a doctorate in criminal law specializing in organized crime. Let's give him a, a warm welcome round of applause. Okay, something's happening. <laughs> oh, you want to do that first? You need to do that. Okay, we're going to have to put a pause on that. Luckily, we're flexible. Um, just before the minister leaves, uh, there's been a very interesting thing that's been going on around lifestyle audits, which we spoke about. Um, and uh, advocate, uh, basically the head of the NPA is one of the f is, is the very first person in the country to voluntarily undergo a lifestyle audit. So let's first round of applause for that. And advocate uh, Batoy is not. It's not just that she's the first person. This is going to open the doors and really welcome into the space voluntary uh, lifestyle audits of not just uh, public officials, but every single person in the space. So I'm gonna welcome up the minister who's going to present a certificate, uh, but also just speak a little bit about what this means and where this is going. And, and also just before we get there, I think it's also important to note that every single one of us in this room should also commit to doing an undergoing a lifestyle audit. I think also me, as much as I'm a young person, I don't have many things to declare. I'm very happy to undergo a lifestyle audit and really open up the space for young people to do the same. Minister, thank you. Uh, Advocate Bertoy. I. I just want to think that this is the best platform where I could uh, hand over um, the certificate, ethics clearance certificate uh, to advocate Shamila Batoy, National Director of Public Prosecutions. And we as DPSA are very proud to make this presentation to her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> I didn't expect this at all. <laughs> I had no idea this was going to happen, really. <laughs> I'm glad it's been cleared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, Advocate uh, Batoy, she'll have an opportunity to really unpack on her vision um, about anti-corruption. But let's now welcome uh, the Lieutenant uh, General, Libya. The program director, the Honorable Minister of Public Service and Administration, uh, Mr. Mtunu, uh, the Vice Principal of uh, UNISA, Professor Sotiga, the Chairperson of uh, the Public Service Commission Advocate uh, Sizani, uh, the Ambassador of uh, Finland here present, the UN uh, re Resident uh, Coordinator, uh, Ms. Bekele Thomas, uh, the UNODC representative, uh, Mr. Mungale, uh, the UNDP uh, resident representative, uh, Ms. Akicheva, uh, professors uh, Fikeni and uh, Madonsela and uh, fellow academia, uh, the director general uh, here present, Dr. Mampiswana and others, uh, DGs, uh, the auditor general representatives, and the heads of various uh, components in the government here present, uh, Father Mukashwa, uh, the media, uh, business community, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I say all protocol observed, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, in his State of the Nation address in 1995, uh, His Excellency President uh, Nelson Mandela the Great said, I quote, our hope for the future depends also on our resolution as a nation in dealing with the scourge of corruption. Success will require an acceptance that in many respects, we are a sick nation, I unquote. In 2003, 
Dr. Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, as he then was said, I quote, corruption hurts the poor disproportionately by diverting the funds intended for development, undermining government's ability to provide basic services, feeding inequality and injustice, and discouraging foreign aid and investment, I unquote. The Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, the DPCI, or uh, also known as the HOCS, is a principal agency designed to fight serious corruption as invest envisaged in Article 36 of the United Nations Convention Against uh, Corruption. The requirements for independency and adequate resourcing have already received attention in the Constitutional Court in the case of uh, Glenista. The DPCI, through a multidisciplinary approach, conducts major case and project driven investigations that are based on threat assessment in the following three uh, focus area. It's a serious corruption, serious commercial, as well as uh, uh, serious organized crime. The three are intertwined. In terms of uh, Section 17D of the South African Police Service Act, the mandate of uh, the DPCI include the investigation of offenses referred to in Chapter 2 and Section 34 of the prevention and the combating of uh, Corrupt Activities Act of 2004 the DPCI through multidisciplinary approach work closely with the departments, other departments such as uh, the uh, National Director of Public Prosecution, the NPA, the SIO, the FIC, and many others. That is uh, where we call our coming together, the Anti-Corruption Task Team and the Operational Committee. The Anti-Corruption Task Team, which shall have come into existence in October uh, 2010. While others may condemn the practice of corruption, but still practice the same, ours is to put in practice that which is being condemned. We have to be executing. Ours is to investigate and secure the attendance of those who are alleged to be involved in corruption before court. My focus today on the remarks is uh, I have decided that uh, while others have talked about uh, the basic uh, laws and the uh, arrangements, I have got to be practical because ours is to ensure that uh, we implement, we execute that which is being advocated. I decided that I'm going to select uh, just uh, six cases to show as an example why I have quoted the statement of uh, the uh, former United Nations uh, Secretary General who have indicated that uh, whatever happens is actually depriving those who are supposed to be receiving a uh, service. You can imagine that uh, last year the uh, anti-corruption part of uh, the hawks, the serious uh, corruption investigation, have uh, arrested 413 individuals and convicted 265 of those. So if I were to talk about each of this unpack to see the implication, it will take uh, more time. So there is no province that we have not arrested uh, individuals involved in corruption. I'm just citing this uh, few examples to show where it harm the poor uh, most. In the first case, I need to cite that of the uh, land bank. Uh, it is an old matter that uh, comes uh, way back in October 20, uh, 
12 when uh, individuals were arrested. And some of them uh, obviously were holding higher positions uh, in that uh, institutions. Uh, it has to do with the defrauding of what they call Akribibi Fund, a stroke land bank. Uh, an amount of six million was involved in that portion that I'm focusing on. There are other legs that are still pending in court and others we have not yet started already, but uh, it's a matter of uh, dealing with them uh, piece by piece. Uh, the, this uh, BE agriculture project was meant to benefit emerging farmers and assist previously disadvantaged farmers, women and the youth in particular. When the individuals were arrested, uh, they had challenged various aspects of the law, even restarting the whole trial and uh, challenging the convictions when they came. But I need to say that on the 14th of February this year, the uh, former CEO of that particular uh, institution, uh, Land, Land Bank, was uh, sentenced seven years imprisonment. Uh, a former member of parliament who stood accused jointly was sentenced 20 years imprisonment. And the attorney who have worked with them was sentenced 24 uh, years imprisonment. <laughs> In the second case that I need to be uh, citing, is a uh, Etequini municipality. You may have read recently that uh, 12 accused were arrested uh, in May uh, of this year uh, by what we call the uh, National Clean Audit uh, Task Team. These individuals that have been arrested include both uh, municipal officials and um, as well as uh, the service providers. Uh, they are out on bail. And uh, we must say that uh, instead of uh, ensuring that uh, the environment in Etrequini is clean, they have actually misused the 208 million that was allocated. The matter is proceeding and uh, we are working closely with the anti-corruption uh, with the asset for future unit to go and deal with the assets that they shall have accumulated. Uh, as I have indicated, I will not deal with the, the others in detail, but uh, you may have heard about the Amatola district municipality where toilets were supposed to have been uh, built. That is service uh, that was supposed to be given to the uh, community. Ten suspects were arrested on that one where 600 uh, million rents was involved. So the people will be coming again in February 2020. In another uh, case, uh, in Limpopo, we have recently arrested uh, 10 individuals, both working in the uh, municipality, issuing licenses. Uh, 8,600, you get code 14. So when you see a truck or a bus driving past, you are not sure as to whether it may be one of this, but that is where service is supposed to be given to the people. The uh, fifth case that I need to highlight is uh, the school nutrition, where kids are supposed to be fed. Instead of uh, us providing that particular nutrition, an individual agree and begin to dish out money and get invoices and they share. The kids are not uh, getting the uh, meal that they are supposed to be getting. So in, in respect of that one, the case is again coming uh, next year. Uh, the last one that I need to be quoting uh, is the employee of the uh, COCTA, uh, who again Is involved, knows that uh, in, in the particular uh, department, uh, he have got access to processing certain payments. And then uh, he have his company registered elsewhere 
and that company become part of the beneficiaries where the money are processed. And the 7.5 million is actually uh, taken out of those. I have just uh, cited this as a few uh, examples in practical that uh, working with the community, uh, we can actually do more. We expect that uh, next year, we will be focusing more on the municipalities. We have got a certain number of cases that uh, we have lined up. We think that uh, we will be able to make an indent. Those who have committed those must just uh, wait. We are coming to visit them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lieutenant General. Uh, we're going to hear from him again when we do some questions. So I'll, I think uh, you won't have to lose all of the what you wanted to say. You'll still have an opportunity. Um, just before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to start with a quote that I think is particularly pertinent to what we're discussing today. Without strong watchdog institutions, impunity becomes the very foundation upon which systems of corruption are built. And if impunity is not demolished, all efforts to bring an end to corruption are in vain. This was said by uh, Rigoberta Menchu. She's a Nobel uh, Prize laureate. And she said this in 2001 in the Global Corruption Report. Um, and I really think this particular panel has such importance around the institutions that we need to build and support and defend. Otherwise, the fight against corruption will be in vain. Uh, because these are the institutions with the teeth to really bite where it needs to, where people need to get bitten. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker. This is Advocate uh, Motibi. Uh, he's currently the head of the Special Investigating Unit. That's what we know as the SIU. Um, he's held various executive and senior management positions, both in the public and the private sector. That includes Standard Bank, Ned Bank, and SARS. He holds an LLB and a BPROC degree, as well as a postgrad diploma in labor law. Advocate Mutibi has previously worked as a prosecutor and a magistrate. Let's welcome him to the stage. Uh, thank you, uh, program director, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, there's, the list is a bit long of those that uh, get recognized. Uh, in the interest of time, Minister Mkun in his absence, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marcia Sukigwa, United Nations Representative, uh, uh, Ms. Begele Thomas, Chairperson of uh, PSC, my colleague, Advocate Sizani, DGs and heads of entities, civil society present, business, ambassadors from various countries. Uh, everyone in the room, uh, I really greet you uh, and, and, and really look forward to this, to this engagement. United Against Corruption, building a culture of accountability for sustainable development. I was on the panel, and uh, greetings to my colleagues too. Uh, ours is to make sure that we really bring a concrete action to demonstrate that as anti-corruption agencies in the criminal justice system, we reflect the progress that you would expect from us. I represent the entity, as the program director indicated, Special Investigating Unit, which conducts its investigation in terms of Special Investigation Units and Special Tribunals Act 74 of 1996. Those investigations are against serious malpractices, serious maladministration, serious corruption, and our investigations are authorized by a proclamation signed by the president. Concerned about the seriousness of problems and threats posed by corruption to the stability and security of societies, undermining the institutions and values of democracy, ethical values and justice and jeopardizing sustainable development and the rule of law. What do we require? We require a concerted effort to fight corruption, both in public and private sector. We also require a strong and sustainable 
state institutions such as those that we have the privilege to serve. We have to implement effective consequence management to hold those responsible to account. Some of those examples have come through. And research has, has shown that failure to take consequence management and take action against those who are accountable leads invariably to this culture of impunity and therefore the increase in corruption. So we have to put a stop to that. Also consent that comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach is required to prevent and combat corruption effectively. What are we doing? My colleague, the general, has referred to the institution that we call anti-corruption task team. That's where all of us uh, as, as, as law enforcement agencies come together to ensure that we collaborate. In the morning, I think, um, Advocate Cezanne, you mentioned uh, some duplication issues. We ensure in that institution that we avoid duplication because the resources are quite thin. We cannot afford uh, areas of duplication. We identify corruption vulnerable sectors. And at this stage, I would like to just refer you to some of those as examples of what we are doing. We have uh, identified various vulnerable sectors, starting with the health sector. And the health sector, um, uh, Mr. Dave Lois from Work Corruption Watch indicated that we have said we needed, we could have started in any other sector, but I'll show you that we are going to the others as well. So we started with the health sector, and we've put together uh, government institutions, we've put together civil society, business, and other interested stakeholders, uh, Corruption Watch, Section 27, and the other NGOs. Our outer is also part of that. And what are we doing? We're ensuring that all of these allegations that are sitting with them, they sit with a whole lot of allegations. The public goes to them. Public comes to us as well. But we are really just ensuring that we have a concerted effort to uproot corruption in this very important sector that our life depends on. What have we done? We have now launched that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, co uh, that forum. Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum was launched, was launched by the President on the 1st of October 2019, and it also has related investigations already. So these uh, members of this forum have brought the public allegations to the forum, and already we are investigating in the Council for Medical Schemes you know that the Council for Medical Schemes is a regulator for the private health sector where corruption and fraud is so endemic that it invariably leads to the increases of the medical costs. We are already investigating in the Health Professions Council. You know there immediately we are dealing with the doctor registration process. It's fraud with corruption and that if it's not addressed, it will continue to bring out bogus doctors. You go to a hospital or whenever, all you want to is to get well. And now you are there, subjected to the services, health services of a bogus doctor, you can imagine what that would do. We are determined to make sure that that, that area is also attended to. Uh, health Products Authority, where the health products are authorized and, and, uh, and approved, we've, we've received allegations of a fraud in that, in that area. Life as a demand, which you probably all know of, Medical legal claims. In medical legal claims, we have received fraudulent uh, claims that the, that the lawyers, unfortunately, uh, uh, my, my fellow colleagues who are really uh, not, not doing good to our names. We have received uh, uh, fraudulent claims. We have investigated. There's one lawyer or in the Eastern Cape who has been arrested uh, and charged for, for fraudulent claims. Uh, and once he was, and by the way, we worked closely uh, with all the colleagues that are on the, on the table. We worked closely with the Hawks. We worked closely with NPA to make sure that we bring them to book. Uh, that lawyer appeared and was released on 80,000 rand bail. We would like to see the prosecution uh, following up and the appropriate sentence. Um, I indicated that this is one example of where we are busy with in the health sector. We are moving quite swiftly in the local government space. Uh, we will be doing 
this blueprint that we have learned in the health sector will be uh, implementing it in the local government space. But there already, there's already investigations going on. Uh, there's a recent example, a week or two ago, if you read some of the, some of the media, there's a owner of a company and the municipal manager that has been arrested, again after collaboration with our colleagues, uh, where SIU investigated and we engaged uh, the NPA, we engaged Hawks. This owner of a company has been arrested together with the municipal manager. What were they doing? They were colluding to make sure that the municipal uh, uh, structure uh, hires what's called yellow fleet. You know, these big machines that are used to do roads and others. And guess what? Those machines uh, under the pretext that he owns them. So our investigation revealed that he doesn't own them. Uh, he goes there and charges astronomical amounts to the municipalities and they pay uh, under, under fraudulent. So we have identified that he's under arrest. And there's another uh, example that I, need to, that, that I need to cite. There's an investigation that we're dealing with in Mopani district. There where there's, there's, there's water related investigations. Our investigators are quite hard at work. And what happened recently? because of those who would like to corrupt our people. And I'm very glad that we continue to put integrity at the center of what we do. The owner of the company approached one of our lead investigators with, uh, with bribe, to bribe him. And what do they do? They're, they're, because our, our employee, uh, thanks, because our employee uh, put, the set, put integrity at the center of what he does, we then said, okay, we worked closely with our colleagues again. We set up a process, which you would probably guess, it's a, it's, it's a sting operation. Then they came, they were arrested with 300,000 rand uh, in, in cash uh, on, on their hands. And they've been arrested and they'll be put through, uh, put through the, the, the legal process. In the water and sanitation, in the Guiana situation, there's an investigation going on, again corruption, the, the company that got the tender fraudulently, we have now taken them to court. The, the project started off being valued at about 800 million. It's ricocheted to about 2.2 billion. So, so we, got, we got evidence that said this contract was awarded irregularly, fraudulently. What did we do? We took it to court. Because part of what we do as SIU is to, to then institute civil litigation. Over and above the criminal part, we do civil litigation and we take matters to court. And you would have followed up when the president announced in the, in the sauna that uh, he's going to proclaim the special tribunal. The special tribunal is proclaimed and it's now operational. It started off in, 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 in October now. So as we went to the ordinary cause where we would delay because of the court rolls, now all of these matters will take them to the special tribunal and make sure that we recover the stolen monies quickly so that we pay back to the to, to the to, to, to government. Yeah. I've been told that uh, uh, my time is up, but I think those are some of the examples that we wanted to indicate. Uh, we would like to make sure that we continue to contribute to ensuring that the fight against corruption, it can only be won by effective investigation, effective uh, prosecution, effective civil litigation, and I know my colleague will talk about prosecution, but this is the part where we bring in to make sure that we contribute to make sure that they take uh, substantive cases to court. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Advocate Motibi. Uh, to those who don't know, I actually studied law myself. Um, I did a BCom law and I'm actually doing my master's part time now. So all of these um, advocates, I think, I hope one day to, to also be an advocate. So it's actually very inspiring as a young person who studied law to see uh, the actual implementation and the fruit um, of many of those who came before us. Um, and I think on that note, it's also important to note um, then just before I introduce our next speaker, um, but Advocate Batoi, I mean, as a woman, as a young woman who studied law, who's very aspirant in that space, um, I can't tell you how much it means to see that representation of women. Um, and, you know, it, it feels real. You know, you grow up and you want to change the space. You want to break these stereotypes. And then we see women like you actually do it. 
Um, so I have to have to say that as a young woman, it's incredible, um, it's refreshing, and really it's also energizing because it means that the fight against patriarchy, against misogyny, and the fight for women representation, it's, it's working, it's starting to work, um, which is really, really incredible, I think, just to, just to come across as a young woman. So I really, really wanted to talk about, uh, talk about that. Um, so let me introduce you formally now so that everybody also can sing your praises. And this is advocate um, Shamila ba Batoi. Um, she's the first woman to be the national director of a public prosecution. Let's first, that's very important. <laughs> and not only is she the first woman, but she has also served as a legal advisor at the International Criminal Court from 2009 to 2018. She led the prosecution of the Proteus cricket captain, Hansi Cronier, at the King Commission of Inquiry in 2000. Um, she's also served as the Director of Public Prosecutions in KwaZulu-Natal from 2000 to 2009. So she's not just a woman, she's a merited woman, um, and I think defeats every single stereotype that they like to throw at us. Uh, so let's welcome her to the stage. Thank you very much. Let me firstly say, since my colleagues did such a good job of recognizing people here, I say I concur. <laughs> Uh, or protocol observe. Um, firstly, let me say, you know, yeah, being the first woman national director, I say, why? Why now? Why me? And then I say, I think I know. The men mess it up and then they bring the women to sort things out. <laughs> no disrespect to women, to men, to my colleagues. Um, but really, we were talking earlier on and I said, give women a chance, young women like this. Look at the state of this world. It's a mess. Look at the state of this country. It's a mess. And who's been running the world? Give women a chance. And the thing I say is, can we do any worse? I don't think so, frankly. But anyway, um, well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, speaking to all of you um, from various sectors uh, in South Africa. and. Um, you know, I want to just say a few things about corruption. I mean, you know it all. I think you're here more to, to, to listen to what are we doing about it. But just on a more general, you know, uh, in a more general sense, corruption begets more corruption. We've seen it. And it fosters a corrosive culture of impunity. We all know about that. We've lived through it. Um, and so international days like this are really important occasions for us to raise awareness, to really rethink where we are, and to mobilize political will and other resources, many of it in here, so that we can actually deal with corruption in a more decisive way. And, in, and also in order for us to meet our global sustainable development goals that you've heard about here. And sustainable development goal number 16 is an important one. And that talks to peace, justice, and strong institutions. And that is what you heard about this morning in the early section. You heard words like ac accountability, strong institutions. And so let's take stock about our own country. Where are we? Peace, justice, and strong institutions. How peaceful are we as a country? We're not at war, for sure. But how can we be peaceful when people are fearful that they're going to become victims of crime every day? Do we re have real peace? Crime rates are unacceptably high. How many victims, how, how strong, how, how committed are we to respect for the rule of law? I mean, in recent times, the rule of law, respect for it, has been stretched almost beyond recognition. recognition. And how strong are our institutions? When I talk about institutions, we talk about institutions of state like institutions in the criminal justice system, the police, the prosecution, the NPA, um, SIU, various other government institutions, parliament, how strong is parliament? How strong are all of these institutions? And the reality, people, is that in recent times, we cannot think, I mean, you know, you, we, are, we are all, I am a citizen of this country. I am as appalled as you are about where we are and where this country has come from. So understand that is a pretext from which I do my work every day. I am appalled. And we want to see people 
held accountable. We want to see, I mean, the, one of the earlier speakers this morning talked about the fact that one of the most important deterrents to crime is the knowledge that there will be consequences, that there will be a proper investigation, there will be a proper prosecution, and there will be a penalty. And in recent times, I'd say if I was a criminal, it was a fairly good risk to take, a business decision, that you could actually, the chances of you ever coming to court, it's extremely slim. And things haven't changed much because we are trying to build strong institutions. And when you look at what has happened in the past nine years, people want to see action, I know. As Advocate Cronier said, the director, she says, my word, I don't want to go anywhere because people look at me with this when expression on my face, you know. And that is true, I can understand that because people are tired. The Zondo Commission is there every day, demonstrating more and more how institutions in this country have failed the people of South Africa. And unfortunately, the Zondo Commission actually makes it very difficult for us as law enforcement, because what it does is the expectations are huge. People are hearing it every day. So I mean, the obvious question is why? And, and in as much as the general has mentioned a number of cases, and you know, those are really important cases, and it shows that the wheels of justice are turning. I know people wanted to turn faster, but understand that we are dealing with a situation where the wheels have been, it's all rusted. You know, it's not even moving, it's grinding. You gotta start chipping away at that rust, slowly start getting it to move. And when it does start gaining momentum and moving, it will be, a snowball effect, and you will see things moving a lot quicker. But in the beginning, there are, and I'm not gonna go through the cases that, there are, besides that, there are a number of other things that are going on. And so people within the NPA, besides law enforcement, and I'll talk just a minute on, we are doing lots of things. I know we're having a Q&A later, we're already late, so I'm, I'm aware of the time constraints. But I can tell you a whole lot of things about what is going on in the NPA. We have a new vision that is based on four pillars, and that is independence, fierce independence. And of course, it's guaranteed in the Constitution, but we know what happened in the past 10 years, even in the NPA. In the Hawks, we know what happened in the Hawks. General Libya is trying to build a damaged institution, and so, so am I and my team in the NPA. Don't quite have the team yet, that's another challenge, but we're trying to get there. But the thing is, we, so it's independence, fierce independence, credibility. We don't have credibility. The people don't trust institutions of state. And we have to build that credibility so that when we speak as the NPA, as law enforcement, people trust us and they know that that is what we're going to do. Professionalism, which was also mentioned this morning, that is the third pillar. And professionalism has a range of, of various you know, tentacles. And one of it is integrity, which we talked about. And yes, I mean, in the NPA, I have made it very clear to prosecutors. I've just completed visiting all the prosecutors in the country just two weeks ago. Not all the prosecutors, all the divisions, as many prosecutors as I could. I've made it very clear to them that if you even think about it, understand there'll be a process and you'll be fired. And that is it. There is no room for corrupt prosecutors. And so we must, we must, we must actually lead by example. We cannot say one thing and do something else. And that is why I said I am prepared, uh, Robert McBride was in my office and I said to him, I'm prepared here. Go ahead, do an, inter an in, um, enhanced integrity, lifestyle audit on me. I'm actually having, and I submitted myself and four or five of my people were around there. I said, any one of you got any objections? No one did. And we've started that process. We have to do it, people. It's, but understand, it is, and the last one, the fourth pillar is accountability. That's where the NPA lost its way in the past nine. We were not being held accountable. And I must at this point pause to recognize the role of civil society and the media in trying to hold government accountable in recent times. Because if that didn't happen, we might as well have just gone over that precipice. We're still there on the edge. We haven't moved back yet, but civil society played a huge role and we are very, very pleased 
that we're working together with civil society now and all our colleagues in law enforcement to do a whole range of things. We talked about the ACTT, the structure that General Labia talked about. Yes, it is a coordinating body, but for the, it was formed in, 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 in 2010. What happened in the past nine years? The ACTT did not do what we were supposed to do. And so we are now trying to resurrect this, this uh, vehicle so that we can deal with corruption outside of the investigating directorate within the NPA, which is mainly focused on state, state capture, and which, I mean, there's, there, people, there are things happening. I know you want it to move faster, but there's so much going on behind the scenes, and you will see things happening. The recent asset forfeiture with regard to the reg regiments, it's a huge matter. And, the Estina investigation is progressing. There's a whole lot of things to do. So I'm not gonna go into detail, but I just wanna to touch on, I have two minutes. I wanna to touch on the fact that you, we can look at law enforcement and say when, when are we doing? But what role does, do you as ordinary citizens have to, have to play in making sure that we move forward in a corrupt free society? I mean, how many of you would pay a bribe to get out of a traffic fine? Tell me, how many of you would do that? So where, is, where are the values? We stand and shout and say, oh, there's somebody, because it's billions and billions and because now the country, and we're not able to serve the poorest of the poor, but where are the values? And that is what, what is so important. And the youth of today, you have it in your hands. You have the power. I say to the people of the NPA, we need more young people. We want the youth. And universities like UNISA have got to start teaching not only, you know, um, law or whatever, so that we can earn and get money and, and then, you know, buy a big house and buy a big car and have children and then we need to get more money to pay for all of that. Teach values. You have to start changing the way we educate right from the bottom. And that is, that is so important as we move forward. And so I know we have, we have a Q&A and I'm, I'm going to, you know, as leaders in this country, we, we have, I mean, the leaders of, of this country lost the way in the, in the recent times. We as leaders, and this came up early this morning, ethical leadership, what does it mean? And so colleagues, we from all sectors, including you know, the National Prosecuting Authority, law enforcement, we have to turn this ship around. We have no, we have no choice in this. I mean, the country is on the edge, and I have committed to the NPA that they will have ethical, strong leadership at all levels. And in addition to that, we collectively have got to show the way. And so in as much as this mountain looks really, really high, and you know, you have no, the challenges in law enforcement, they are huge. But I feel very, very confident that even, you know, just listening to what's going on here, things are going to turn around. And so if all of us, and yes, I am going to come under attack, I know that. It's going to happen. As we get more and more uh, effective in what we do, yeah, there's going to be, the sharks are swimming around. They're not sitting around waiting, you know, as, as General Lubia said. They are planning their strategies. And so part of it is attack the people, attack the prosecutors, try to make it impossible for, do, for them to do their work effectively. And that is when we need civil society and we, as long as we're doing the right thing, to stand up, because generally the voices of those that want to disrupt, disrupt is the loudest. Uh, and the others don't say anything. And you know what they say? Injustice flourishes when good people do nothing. We need to all say what role, in fact, what am I doing to cause this in the first place? Let me change that. And then what do I do to make a difference? And together, I know we can. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Advocate uh, Batoy. I think that was yeah, quite, quite inspiring, and I think there's some of it which we'll talk about that we don't really want to hear about how we all have a role to play, and it's not just uh, people in certain positions uh, who are going to conduct the cleanup. Um, just before, I mean, I, I want to talk about something very quickly before I introduce uh, the Auditor General. Uh, one of the things I've encountered over the last few months as, a, as an MPL, as a member of the provincial legislature, is that a lot of our oversight tools often feel like they're not strong enough. Um, and I was remarking to some friends and colleagues recently around how I'm developing what I now call a corruption sense. 
It's like a spidey sense, you know, when you feel like something's gonna come. I'm developing this corruption sense where uh, you read the documents, you cross-check, you see the numbers. What did the department say three months ago? Okay, what are they saying now? And it's, it's happening, but it's an exhausting process, and also it's not an effective one because the tools that we have aren't really, I think, being utilized as well. Um, and also, perhaps, what we also need to talk about is training. Um, and that's more of an internal discussion, but I think is important, because do our public representatives, does someone like myself have enough training to actually hold government accountable, to actually do our work um, of oversight? So I think that's something that I really just wanted to talk about before we open up the discussion. Uh, but let me introduce you all to Jan van Skalkveik, He's the member of EXCO, of the Auditor General of South Africa. Um, he's also the head of the Secretariat um, in his capacity uh, in terms of building, sorry, let me start this again. So there's an organization called the Internal Organization of Supreme, Co uh, Supreme Audit uh, uh, Institutions. So that's called INTOSI. Uh, and he plays, as, as head of Secretariat here, he then sits in his capacity in building that team. And that's a global organization of auditor generals. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, welcome up uh, Mr. Van Skalkveik, who will really be representing the AG and speaking to these different tools. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Advocate, I think you said you concurred. Um, can I attest to the fact that you've concurred and move on? All protocol observed. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to join you here on, on International Anti-Corruption Day. And I think a special word of thanks to, to the organizers that positioned this day around the concept of accountability. Um, for us in the National Audit Office, accountability is the food of the day. Um, we have a very specific focus on the terms of accountability, and in essence, it talks about whether government can manage its finances, whether they can report on their performance honestly, and whether they've got respect for the law. Um, and I think a lot of you may know the term from, from our general reports where we talk about clean audits. Well, let me just turn it around. If you haven't got a clean audit, it means that you've got no control over your finances. You're probably dishonest in your performance reporting, and your respect for law is really not what it should be. And that creates an environment that's absolutely fertile for corruption. Whether it is the smallest things like bribes or paying to get out of a traffic fine or full-scale corruption. Um, so for years we've had this mandate to report on this, but we did so within a system that assumed that Parliament or accounting officers or accounting authorities would step up and deal with that. Unfortunately, that's not held true. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the things that the press always love, irregular expenditure, in the past PFMA cycle amounts to roughly about 60 billion rands. Now, that is expenditure done in contravention of law. Lots of people have got arguments about whether this is administrative in nature, whether this is just a process that needs to be fixed up, or whether this is really full-scale corruption. But the legislation demand of accounting officers to deal with irregular expenditure. So this is known irregular expenditure, known warning signals. And in the last Auditor General General Report, um, the one that was published uh, about three, four weeks ago, we could show that 80% of accounting officers and accounting authorities did not even bother to investigate irregular expenditure. So this is known per project, probably per person, yet nobody is doing something about that. Um, so this, 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 this regard of warning signals that lead us to corruption is absolutely immense. Um, the good news on our side is that very recently, um, 1st of April, the President signed into law certain additional powers for, for the audit office, and uh, it centers around a new concept called material irregularity. Let me read you the definition of it, quite academic. MI is defined as any non-compliance with or contravention of legislation, any fraud, theft, fiduciary duty that we identified during an audit that resulted in is likely to result in material financial loss, misuse of public resources, or substantial harm to public. A massive all-encompassing definition. Um, and we can deal with these material irregularities, these MIs, in one of three ways. We can refer this to some of the bodies that's, that's sitting here, and I'm sure the heads of these organizations will know that we're all busy trying to sharpen up those relationships between them. Um, these would be referrals where we don't have a capacity or not the appropriate capacity to deal with. We need that partnership. Over and above referrals, we can issue binding remedial action 
Um, and we can also go in extreme cases to issuing certificates of debt to, to recover. So let me share with you what our, our initial stab at these new powers mean. Keep in mind that we started on the 1st of April. Um, we decided to pilot um, a couple of instances in, in the last PFMA cycle, the cycle that dealt with departments and public entities. We just selected on a risk profile 16 auditees. Of those 16, 12 we could wrap up by the deadline time. Um, probably um, there's a, a bit of a message in the fact that we couldn't wrap, on, wrap up on, on the others. But let me stick to the 12. According to the latest general report, within that 12 we found 28 instances of material irregularities. Financial loss that amounts to 2.81 billion. And of that 2.51 is something that's already known to accounting officers or accounting authorities. So they can almost act immediately. To give you a sense, the biggest amount of that, probably about 2 billion of that relates to PRASA, and I think you would have seen if you've watched Twitter as, as you spent, the minister made some, some interesting announcements around PRASA already this morning. Um, other people that's, that's also covered in this, 10 material irregularities at human settlements and free state, process sits at, at nine. If you think about a small little pilot that deals with just 12 out of a massive amount of entities that gives us 2.5 billion, you've got a sense of what um, the inaction is. So the MI, just to complete the loop, um, this will only di disappear from an audit report once we've either taken steps to prevent that problem or we've recovered money or there's been action taken against the person. So let's, let's talk about our experiences in raising this at auditees. Um, we've invested a lot of time, our Auditor General specifically over the last six months, to get out and talk about these new powers. These are powers that's designed to remind accounting officers and accounting authorities what their jobs are as per legislation. And if I suddenly step up and do exactly that, that's first prize. If it means that one day we do not use our new powers at all because accounting officers are doing their bit, that would be absolutely, absolutely fantastic. The interesting thing for us was with these 12 entities, well, 16 that we started off with, 12 completed, is the positive reaction they had from accounting officers. People that really stepped up to the plate and dealt with these in a very, very constructive days. They only had about 20 days to respond actively to, to what we've raised as MIs, um, and we've seen fantastic, solid responses, well-considered, robust responses, and we've seen that in the majority of cases, action has actually been taken. So we take this as an extremely positive effect. It's, it's clearly early days, um, but um, if people start taking accountability like we've seen in these cases, and I stress again, this election was the risky clients that we have, um, this should bode well for us to, to go forward. A message that you all have heard um, from our Auditor General in the last couple of months is that this asks of accounting authorities to think very differently about their work not just to try and solve issues when you get to audits or to try and resolve MIs, but to really be preventative in what they do, to design their controls, to pick these issues up before they occur, or if they occur, they can deal with them way before we find audit. It makes the role of internal audit, um, audit committees, you've referenced a lot of the oversight structures, so much more important. Corruption affects the poorest of the poor in the worst possible way. Um, there's a quote that our Auditor General used quite often. Andrew Cantor wrote the following about corruption. The systemic implications of poor governance are not merely academic or emotional, but it has real-world on-the-ground consequences. As a result, South Africa's global credit quality has deteriorated. Confidence has been shattered. There's been a paucity of capital investment, and the cost of borrowing to fund houses, education, infrastructure, and business has risen. For all South Africans, the economy is not growing. It's not globally competitive. The cost of governance failures is real, tangible, and terrible. As a country, we cannot afford this. Strengthening accountability by giving full effect to our mandates and working together as the people presented here today are first steps to rooting out corruption in South African society and making sure that the citizens of our country see the benefits that's promised to them in the constitution of our country. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I didn't even have to give a time warning. Um, just before we go into the most exciting part, I think, of our discussion, uh, Father Mkachwa has requested, and I think it's a very good request, uh, it's going to raise the, the energies in the room, 
So we're going to do a round of uh, down, corruption, down. So I'll say down, corruption, and then you'll say down. Uh, and then we'll do one of fight as well, because we're just going to, yeah. So let's do, let's actually start with an amandla to warm us up, you know, just to get us in the mood. Amandla! Amandla! Awe to? Down, corruption! Down! Down, corruption! Down. Right, let's, we're going to do it again, but I want us to really get into it, you know? We must believe it, we must have some serious conviction because, and then we're going to do fight because that's how we're going to end it off. So I'm going to say it fully, down, corruption, down, then you say down. I think it will work better. Down, corruption, down! Down! Down, corruption, down! Down! Fight, corruption, fight! Fight! Fight, corruption, fight! Fight! There you go. That's, that's, I don't know, I feel, I feel quite energized. I'm ready to go into battle. We could have done a haka here, but it might have been a bit awkward, given that we're all in suits. Uh, I'm going to sit back down, and we're going to open up now for the question and answer session and some discussions. Uh, so depending on time, let's note the first round. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more biased towards women and towards young people. I have to give you a heads up, it's necessary. Um, but that's, that's how we're going to start it. And then I'll say, I'll give one question and then we'll open up. But I'm going to sit here and we'll conduct the Q&A a little bit more organically than just podium kind of discussion. make eye contact with me and hand gestures. Then we can go back, go back to our traditional way of doing it. Um, I think, just my first question, uh, and that will open up the discussion. What can ordinary people or citizens of South Africa who may not be the head of the SIU or the Hawks or the NPA or the AG, what can we do to ensure that the fight against corruption is won? Um, because it seems like it's happening over there and we're all impatient and we're like, when is it happening, what's going on? But what can we do um, as people, as citizens of South Africa, to really ensure that we win this fight? So before you answer, I'm going to now note some hands. Uh, so put them up quite high. I've noted you, sir, because you were very enthusiastic. If there's any other questions, I have lots of questions, but of course. <laughs> okay, so, oh, there we go. Thank you, ma'am in the black. Any other questions, or perhaps we... Okay, thank you, there in the front, and we've got three, technically four. Is it... Is it... Okay, perfect. All right, so um, when you ask your questions, it would be preferable to say who it's um, directed toward, but of course, panelists, if you have a thought on something, um, I'm not going to restrict that uh, answer. Sir, I think we'll give you a platform first. Perhaps when you speak, just come try and find one of these devices so we can all hear the question. Any, any? Please, sir, if you could introduce yourself so we know who you are. You can just introduce yourself. I exhausted all the internal and external resources to persuade my case, but my case was dismissed by fraudulent records from the beginning council. So uh, a blessing in disguise, I've got uh, the people who can represent all the institutions that I went through, because corruption is not the institution, it's a person. It's a person, it's not an institution. Because the bargaining council, <coughs> there's no award. Uh, we've got a specialist of labor law here, of which you will agree with me that the commissioner have contraven 138 <coughs> Labor Relations Act, whereby he was supposed to issue an award within 14 days, but he failed. 
After that, uh, <coughs> at Labour Court, I went for a review at Labour Court, and the, court, the, the, the judge issued an order to bargaining council to dispatch award within five days. To my unfortunately, there was no award, but the uh, government representative of which he was not with him, he exceeded his power in actual fact because he was supposed to end up at arbitration, but he ended up doing a fraudulent records to labor court. So I can see corruption, it, it, it won't never end because it's done by the high positioned employees or designated empl government employees like uh, secretary for bargaining council the commissioner no the, the, the problem my, my case have been dismissed with fraudulent record at labor court that is the bottom line of mine so i want help because there are relevant in this panel there are the relevant person, a labor law specialist. And in my case, there is elements of constructive dismissal because I've been assaulted at work. Again, there was illegal deduction where Department of Health and UNISA, they perverted my salary by saying that I'm owing UNISA, whereas they didn't pay UNISA. So after I, 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 I constructively dismissed during 20, 2009, but to 2010, the department is only pay UNISA, and I'm not certain whether they did pay UNISA. But I've got constructive dismissal in short. And again, sorry, uh, I, I've got three questions. To be fair, I've, I, the time is, time is running. Let me give questions to the other people who've been noted. In the second round, I can allow you if there aren't other questions. You've had an opportunity. Let's also allow other people. Thank you, sir. Okay. In the next round, sir. In the next round. All right. Uh, can I hand over now to uh, the lady in the black? You can introduce yourself in your question. And also time. Let's get straight to the question. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Program Director, and greetings to the speakers. Uh, my question is actually uh, very short. Um, the first question is, we are all aware that the Tribunal Court has been set up by the President in October, if I'm not mistaken, where the Minister of Justice was giving, but we haven't seen anything coming out of that, and we really can't wait to see how it works, because the their processes are much more easier than the normal courts. They're working not really, they're working on the balance of probabilities, they're working on a lot of things that can get results uh, quite quickly. When are we gonna start seeing cases being referred to that court? That's the first question. The second question is, what is the role of treasuries in all this? Because they're very close to um, these government institutions, they monitor them, they're writing uh, the frameworks and for it, for it for them, and they must, they should be mastering the PFMA more than uh, most of the other institutions. So what is their role? How are they going to be utilized the treasuries in all of this? Because when you look at all these processes, mainly is the contravention of PFMAs, and we are all aware of the pitfalls which have happened in a lot of cases that were purely of the uh, PFMA contraventions, how they went um, down the drain. And treasuries might have assisted. I know in other, in other provinces they invite treasuries to do trainings on PFMA and all of that, but I feel that it is not enough. That we might need to involve them much more in these processes because they are close to the ground and they know the acts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's get the third. I mean, I assume that one was to uh, advocate Motivi in terms of uh, the special uh, tribunal and role of treasuries, I think, is an open question to all of us. Yeah, we can share on that. Uh, let's get the third question, and if you could introduce yourself, that would be appreciated. I just want to confirm that the mic's working here. 
<laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Silabe Kute. I work in the private sector, but I'd like to speak on behalf of just uh, members of the ordinary electorate as a young graduate taxpayer. And I'm going to try to keep my question quite concise, and any one of the panelists can answer this question. I think one thing we can realize when it, or acknowledge is that we live in a low growth environment, but I think what's more important is that we live in a low trust environment. Members of the electorate uh, have a trust deficit with their public representatives and law enforcement agencies. What practical steps can we take in re-establishing that decaying trust um, in order to move on as a country and trust each other? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got sufficient questions, I think, in which to answer. Perhaps we should begin with the more specific ones before we deal with the general ones. So let me hand over to Advocate Motivi for the special tribunal question. And then, yeah. No, thank you for that question. Um, firstly, the special tribunal, uh, the, 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 the word special tribunal are used in terms of the act, and yes, there are various other tribunals. <coughs> In this case, the special tribunal is, has got the same jurisdiction as the high court, right? So, so the processes that are applicable in the high court would apply here. And you're right, uh, in terms of the standard of proof, is not the same as the criminal uh, case standard, is the case, uh, is, is, is on a preponderance of probabilities. But you still have to produce evidence. So, to your question, now the functioning of this court. You have heard that it's been, it's been established. Uh, the minister signed the, the regulations, and, and the special tri uh, tribunal president uh, also signed off on the procedures that would apply. There's about eight judges appointed. As, as we speak today, and, and um, you may have seen in the media, perhaps not, uh, there's already six NGOs who defrauded the Department of Health in Gauteng around the life as a demand. Those cases have already been issued. Uh, the summonses have already been issued, so they are underway. Uh, and you know the process is you issue a summons and you know the other party responds, and then once they've responded, there's a court date agreed, right? Um, there's a, th those cases have already been issued. By last week, uh, there's about 11 service providers from the Northwest uh, you know that government did a what we call uh, in intervention, you know, uh, putting the, some of the departments under administration, uh, in particular the Department of Education, where some of these cases were found. Eleven service providers who were defrauding the department in the scholar transport uh, uh, area. Those cases have already been taken to the to the to the special tribunal. We've got. Uh, there's one case in ESCOM, which is in the ordinary course, but already there's now two cases who are relevant to this coal, coal uh, business. There's already two that we have identified that will be taken to the, to the special tribunal. All in all, there's about, as, as I speak today, and there's more coming because the investigations are going on, there's about 11 matters that are ready to go to the special tribunal, and the value thereof is more than 10 billion. Right? Uh, th that's the value of the contracts that are um, on, 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 uh, been disputed and been found to be irregular. Uh, over and above this civil litigation going to the special tribunal, we have also found that the officials in all these entities, be it ESCOM, Department of Education, over and above the irregular contracts that are going to the special tribunal to be set aside and recoveries made to government, there's also civil uh, disciplinary processes that have been taken to the officials that have been responsible, right? And there's also instances where we have found that there was criminal action, and those will be taken through the criminal, criminal, criminal process. Okay. Thank you. All right, I think the mic was off, but I think we would have heard uh, what the answer, no, that, that's, we'll watch that. Um, let's now deal with, um, I think the role of treasuries, is there anyone who wants to take a peek at that? Mr. Van, Sal Van Scalfi? Thank you very much. Um, I can't agree with you more that the treasury is an important part of it. Just, just from our own mandate, we've, we've always talked about treasury as the people that sets the rules, that enable, and we're testing against that. And so it's an absolute key partner in there. And I, I would probably agree with you that um, we've forgotten to invest properly into our national treasuries. 
So if you take it back to the comments I made, where I said it's wonderful that we catch things at the end. It's fantastic that there is pain to consequences. That's necessary. But if we want to go for preventative, in other words, make sure that it does not happen. Mm. We need to talk to the people that sets the rules. Mm. And that would start with the national treasury. Yeah. Can I be naughty and steal the question about yeah. trust? And how do we restore trust? I think restoring trust starts with something very important. And it's close to your question as well. Um, it starts with leading by example. Doing the right thing yourself before you demand something from somebody else. In our organization, we've got a very clear rule that we will not audit against a rule that we don't apply ourselves and that we don't apply at a level of excellence. And I think that goes for any of us. You've talked about accountability, but it talks about us in our private lives. It's wonderful to scream about the things that's going wrong, but if you encourage that, if you do that in your life, if you prepare to pay bribes, it doesn't help. And I think for all of us, so it's lead by example, be absolutely accountable. So when there's annual reports of organizations here, departments, etc., read that, see if they really do justice to what you want to hear, and make a noise. We've heard so much about civil society this morning that can intervene and hold people accountable. Make the most of those. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone else from the panel? That's left, left in general. You can speak first, then we'll give it to Advocate Motivi. Thank you very much. I, I think that on three questions I'll just chat, touch uh, shortly. What can we do to ensure that uh, the war is won and uh, what needs to be done uh, to end trust? I, I take that as one. I think that uh, from the uh, Hawks point of view, if you can provide us with the information, follow it up and see what happens. I expect that uh, when we have received information, we will communicate with you and then uh, you decide from there as to whether you trust what uh, you, we said we will do. I expect all my uh, officials to do precisely what the law expects them to do. So that is the beginning of building trust. And uh, the layers that uh, we have uh, appointed recently, I think that I'm uh, getting satisfaction, that I see that uh, something is happening. So. Whenever you are not getting that satisfaction, elevate it to the next level. Mm. And in that way, we are able to monitor as to whether our officials are doing what is expected of them. That uh, uh, touches on the two questions. Maybe the uh, one dealing with the rule of uh, uh, the Treasury. I can't agree more that uh, the uh, National Treasury is actually the backbone of most of the work that uh, we do. In most of the work that uh, we do, we also expect an affidavit from that particular environment because they are in a better position to unpack certain laws to say that this is where contravention took place. And over and above, uh, we have agreed and then uh, we, have, we have actually uh, passed a resolution in the anti-corruption task team that they come and do training on the Public Finance Management Act as well as the Municipal Finance Management Act. So in some of the cases, they even advance the payment of uh, the chartered accountants so that we don't go through the whole long process of acquiring the services and uh, we just have to transfer the necessary uh, funds. So we work closely with them. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the role of the treasuries. And as uh, General mentioned, almost, at least in the special investigating units, almost 80% of our investigations are procurement-based. Right? Uh, and, and for obvious reasons, that, that's where procurement, government procurement is the money spinner. And obviously they would say there must be a corruptor and a corruptee. There's a whole lot of private sector companies that, you know, uh, collude with... Uh, with, with seniors, but in government, the treasuries are the owners of risk management frameworks, right? <laughs> procurement frameworks. So in our investigation, we come across a whole lot of systemic improvements that needs to be done. So, so we do engage with the treasuries, be it provincial or national, so that when, when they make the rules, they take these findings into account uh, and improve on the on the processes and that has already started happening. We are likely to see positive changes. Thanks 
just, just before Advocate Patoy, before you respond, I think the first gentleman, I mean, even if, I know it's very specific, but if there's some broad advice uh, we could give to him or people in his position where I think the system has failed. I think that's really what the, where the frustration is. You've gone through some of the recourse. What now do I do if I don't have access? So I think let's, let's look at it like that, but please go ahead. Yes, just very quickly on the two questions about trust. And, you know, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, we can only build this trusting relationship. And as I said, one of the key pillars for the NPA is credibility. And so we, we, can, we have to earn that trust, each one of us, by what we do. And so trust is not going to happen until we demonstrate in very real terms that we have actually earned the trust of the people. And I don't think that will be too difficult, certainly speaking from the perspective of the NPA. I think we are on, the, on track to do that. But at the end of the day, the people of the country will, will make that call. In fact, we want to, in our, in our part of our strategies, we actually want to include levels of trust that people have as a measure you know, of, of whether we are now, you know, and if, even in terms of dealing with corruption, just I'll quickly raise it, but the MTSF, Medium Term Strategic Framework, that we've been developing with our other partners, we've actually put in as one of the, the measures is, are we able to actually improve our rating and transparency international in terms of how we deal with corruption? That will be indicative of whether we are on the right track. So those are just on the other side. But what can we as citizens do, just to your question? I'll just give you one example. There was a case that came across my table last week. There was a woman who wanted a job in a as a security guard, went to a police station, and I don't know what the, the previous conviction was, but inquired, what do I need to do to get this previous conviction expunged? And the police officer basically said, pay me X amount of money. And so what the woman did is, she went and reported the matter. Here she was wanting this job she reported the matter, there was a sting operation, and the police officer was dismissed. Now, that is the kind of conduct that you want. And when I saw that and came before my desk, I then wrote back to my deputy and I said, what is the previous conviction of this person? Is it something minor that we can actually help her in trying to get it expunged so that she can get a job as a security guard? Because we must reward positive behavior. And so, you know, that's the kind of things you expect citizens to do. Here's a woman who needed a job, and she said, I will not stand up. I mean, that person needs a medal, you know, really. So that's the kind of conduct that we want. In terms of just generally dealing with corruption, I think we are, we are generally selfish people. We think about ourselves. What can I get out of this? Can I make something here? We forget about going to selfless. Selfless is too far down the line. We talk, let's start getting being unselfish to start off with. That is, think about not just us. What can I get out of it? Après vous, after you. You go first. Simple things, just letting people go ahead of you. Not thinking about me, my spouse, my kids. Think beyond that. Think about your communities. Think about your country. It's one step, as the more you go out of this me, it's about me and what I can get out of it, I think the whole world will benefit from it. So let's just start moving out a little bit, think less about ourselves and more about others. I think that will be a good start. No, thank you. I wanted to just contribute to assisting our brother here. Um, and, and I mean, my colleagues can come in as well. Um, but it sounds like it's a, it, it's a dismissal case and you've, you're putting in the word constructively uh, and then you, you seem to have gone to the council and um, the, your case, as you believe, was dismissed either the Labour Court based on fraudulent documentation, you say. Uh, it, it sounds to me like that this is a matter, uh, and, 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 and I'm going to preface by saying uh, you, you, you continue to say fro corruption will never end. So where you've got indications that there was corruption, and you mentioned that you've gone to the public protector, and perhaps we must put an asterisk on that and help you that if, if, if there's no satisfaction that you're getting at a, in, in the free state, um, there's probably you know, areas if you've got some of, the, some of the details of your case here, uh, we can probably assist, and, you know, uh, but you would need to be able to escalate. But the gist of your case, 
looks like is, is, is regulated by the Labor Relations Act. Okay? So, and, and there's processes in the Labor Relations Act. Once you are unhappy in your workspace, and I'm not sure if you have been to the CCMA, which is another government institution which is likely able to help. Uh, look, that, that's, the, the, that's the best I can, I can do. Uh, thank you, thank you, Advocate. I think that was, yeah, I think that was quite, quite apt. Um, I'm gonna, s let's try and do one last round of questions. Um, just keeping in mind time, I'm gonna be a bit more strict. Let's not preamble, let's get straight to the question, and then we can allow our panelists to answer. But I must give opportunity to those who haven't spoken yet. Okay, so a uh, lady in the front, I've acknowledged you, nice shawl. Yeah, but I have to give an opportunity to other people who haven't spoken, and I think there has been a question, and also I think it's very specific, so perhaps afterwards uh, we can also engage and see how we, how we manage it. All right, like I said, I'm going to be very biased, and I was very clear about it. Um, lady at the back, I think you're wearing maroon, I can't quite tell. That's number two. And then uh, number three, lady in the black uh, top, but I see I haven't taken from any of this side. Is there time? Okay, let's take those three, and then let's try and also engage. Remember, we also live in a digital age. There's a lot of social media interaction that we can do as well. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hand over to the first speaker, and then we can continue from there. Just introduce yourself, and then we can move on. platform to the lady behind you with the shawl. You may just press the button once. And Thank you, Program Director. Good afternoon. My name is Rafila Mujaledi. I'm from Free State. Um, I've got a question not necessary to anyone specific, maybe just a general. Two questions. The one was, I think earlier uh, Mr. Lewis was referring to the fact that when he was attending here last year, there was a different um, head of the Hawks, for example. And I think in general the heads have changed in terms of the law enforcement agencies. But I wanted to check with regards to what Advocate Batoy said about the fact that he, she wants to change the culture within NPA, considering that normally when you have heads, they come and put, place their foot soldiers um, in certain key positions to make sure that their mandates are running. How secure are the heads in the knowledge that the vision that they have for where they want to take is actually filtering through? That's the firstly. The second question is, um, it's always, uh, and again, I think it, it came from what Advocate Batoy said, where she talks about, you know, how she knows that she's going to get pushed back and the sharks are swimming. Um, it's easier to act when you've got backup in terms of your principles. How convinced are you that there is a political will to turn around the scourge that we have experienced so that it will allow you the room to do your job even when it becomes difficult? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time is running, so let's be very quick there at the back. Okay, um, thank you and good afternoon. My name is Tembe Gila, I'm from Limpopo. Um, you have said a lot about investigations in the SOEs and departments, provincial or national, but I haven't heard or read about um, investigation in constitutional offices. Where do you report such regularities if they are existing within the constitutional office? The, the, be it um, chapter 9 institution or chapter 10, um, because I believe that in most cases there will be like too much silence because these people or these institutions are the ones who are doing the monitoring or they are doing, um, they are checking whether these departments and SOEs are doing work in terms of the prescripts. So who do we report to? Should there be irregularities in these institutions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's have that last question over there. Good day. My name is Lainam Caesar. I'm from Pretoria. Uh, my question is about uh, it's about Scopa hunting down the, SS, the SAA financial uh, statement. I do not understand how it arrives to a point whereby Minister of Finance announced that they offered S, uh, SAA some few billions to, to, for bailouts. How did the minister believe that SAA is bankrupt without those uh, financial records? 
And then another thing is, uh, what determines, uh, uh, what, how, did, how did you determine how much tax money was needed for bailouts? And then another thing is, I think there's a, a problem uh, regarding uh, corruption in South Africa. If we're looking at Lesotho, personal uh, income tax is around 13.6% per person. And then in South Africa, we're paying a lot. I think there's a lot of money in South Africa hanging, lingering around that uh, politicians and public servants recognize that and they know there's money here. That is why corruption is so high and it uh, uh, causes things like uh, it causes things like violence because now uh, politicians are, are killing each other based on the position. The position because once they have positions, they know they'll have a hand to, for 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 for, coffer, to, for, 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 for looting in the coffers. So that is my question for the day. Thank you. I'll be treated. Okay. Uh, so so let's let's when you answer let's do closing statements so we've addressed the matter right let's not do denigrate into anarchy here um so when you answer closing statements we'll do it very quickly and we'll allow for the next panel yeah. who's going to go first <laughs> oh, sorry. okay go ahead let, let thank you very much uh, i need to touch on a question as to who investigate those matters that might be happening in uh, Chapter 9 institutions, uh, including the courts, uh, at whatever uh, level. When it comes to the commission of uh, crime, uh, it is the responsibility of uh, the police in general. There might be a few exceptions when you are dealing with uh, mil military matters, but uh, crime in general will be the responsibility of uh, the South African Police Service. I think when you go to the police station to report that there is a crime committed in either at court or anywhere, they will not refuse that one. Once it is registered, they will be able to channel it to a specific division uh, that have got a mandate to investigate that type of uh, crime. If it is a serious corruption, it will obviously be referred to the uh, hawks. Maybe uh, in conclusion, I would like to call upon uh, us as the community that uh, all of us should actually participate in the process of fighting corruption. We can do that by providing information to the law enforcement agencies. If you are not satisfied with a particular level, provide that information where you have got uh, some sort of uh, satisfaction. I have noted some individuals who might be in Cape Town providing information of what is happening there, talking to somebody in Limpopo that information will be handled in such a way that uh, the uh, identity of uh, the informant uh, is protected. We are committed to be dealing with uh, uh, corruption. And then should you get some sort of frustration within the layers in the DPCI, channel it to national level. Thank you very much. Just be very fast. Okay. Uh, very so. It's okay, just speak. I'm sorry. Oh, it is off. Oh. I uh, just wanted to comment uh, quite quickly around the, uh, my observation on the SAA situation question. <clears throat> uh, as the Special Investigating Unit, uh, we, we had some work that we were doing <clears throat> within SAA, and we assisted the management there to identify a whole number of irregular contracts. So those contracts are now uh, going to receive appropriate uh, investigation, but of importance is that we need to correct what went wrong. Right? So the, 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 the blueprint that I mentioned in the health sector, we are based on the vulnerable sectors. One of the vulnerable sectors identified uh, under this banner of the ACTT is the state-owned entities. Right? And, and there's various investigations going on there, but we need to make sure that we, are, we address it on, 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 a, on a consolidated or comprehensive basis. 
What is it that we have identified? And accountability has to be held at all levels, right? Whether it's the executive authority or the accounting authority, be it the board or any of the executives. So, uh, I mean, I, I really can comment, uh, comment more, a lot around the recent developments, but my observation is government is serious in saving that entity. The, the step that has been taken around voluntary uh, business rescue, it is well understood to be a step to ensure that there's a process to, to save the, the, the institution. But from the law enforcement perspective, we have got, uh, at least as SIU, we've got the work that we are likely to undertake, and whether it's under administration or under the board, we'll work with the responsible individuals to make sure that we identify what went wrong around certain agreements and who is accountable, how can we make sure that we put things right going forward. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just on the question that the lady asked about, uh, you know, you change the heads. Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Because, um, yeah, I mean, there are people in these organizations that were appointed by previous heads that are still there. And that is a concern. It is a serious concern. And it's also when people ask, why is nothing happening? You have people that have been in these institutions. And when we have to deal with it, you know, it is something that has to be addressed. Um, I know, I mean, I worry about the Hawks. I do. I have great respect for General Rubia and what he's doing. But I know the challenges he has. How can we have absolute guarantee that those persons that are investigating these corrupt matters are not involved themselves or not trying to shield people. Unless there's additional vetting, it now enhanced vetting, integrity testing, I have a serious concern about that, even in the NPA. In the directorate that we've set up, Advocate Cronier has put in place enhanced integrity vetting so that we know people that come in there are people that we know have gone through these processes. But in other institutions, we are still at risk. And that's the reality within the NPA. Every other day I'm hearing someone coming to me and saying, oh, I got it. I'm hearing another story about somebody. I think the majority of people in the NPA are good, committed, hardworking prosecutors. But there are people at various levels that I am getting information on. And so uh, I don't know. To answer your question, we have to, but at the end of the day, we need to address it. So when these allegations come forth, I'm not just sitting back and saying, I don't know what to do. There are processes you need to put in place to make sure if they're true, they are proven, and there must be consequences. If they're not, people must be exonerated. But at the moment, we're in that space where you know, things are not political will. You ask the other question. I have absolute confidence that there is political will in this country to deal with corruption. You know, and, and as I said when I was appointed, I sat across the, road, uh, the table with the president and I said to Mr. President, there's, the NPA is an independent entity according to the Constitution, but I'd like you to sit across from me, give me your word that you will not interfere in the work of the NPA. And he unhesitatingly said, do what the NPA has to do and do it properly. And he has never interfered. I've had no, the minister, who's a young 35-year-old, uh, Minister of Justice, I've had absolutely no interference at all. But we know that there's an urgency. We are acutely aware of that, and we are working on that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to make way for the next panel. Thanks.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm facilitating the last panel today, which is on active citizenry. My name is Kavisha Pele, and I am a social justice activist at an organization called Corruption Watch. Unfortunately, our time is very short, as two of our panelists have to leave um, before 3 p.m., so we won't be able to do a Q&A, and that is really unfortunate because they have a lot of meaningful insight. But just to start and kick off this discussion, I think Advocate Batoy had touched on why active citizenry is so important in the fight against corruption. And we know that in South Africa, we have a history of people's power. Um, it was people's power that had challenged the apartheid regime. It was people's power that demanded the government uh, provide treatment for those living with HIV. It was people's power that every single day protests so that we can get services, so that the government is uh, to demand that the government abide by their constitutional obligations. And recently, it's been people's power that has really brought corruption to the forefront. You know, we were talking about active citizenry. At Corruption Watch, we have 28,000 reports from whistleblowers who sort of sacrifice their safety and every day come to us with some sort of allegation and who are actively taking a stand. So I think that this is an important discussion and going into the next decade, we've come out of a very difficult one, going into the next decade where we are going to undoubtedly face a lot more um, challenges. I think it's time to rethink, re-energize and reinvent how we are going to, as citizens of this country, challenge power. So the first speaker that I'm going to invite up is Professor Tuli Madansela, who of course needs no introduction. And I want Prof Madansela to basically touch on the questions of what is active citizenship? What will it look like in 2020? And you know, go uh, sort of go further than what Advocate Butoy was saying about what can, why is it important to have active citizenship in the fight against corruption? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Yanisa, DPSA, and colleagues, and thank you uh, to everyone who's still here. And happy International Anti-Corruption Day. It is my hope and wish that one day we could be in the same situation as um, a Swedish colleague who attended a conference with us in New York where we were telling them stories and uh, case studies from the integrity front. Oh, no, no, the colleague was not from Sweden. He was from Holland. Sorry, Sweden, if you're in the room. And, we had all of these horror stories to tell, both South Africa and America, and the guy from Holland only told us a story about a traffic officer who stole money from the parking meter. And when it came to question time, he was asked, say, don't you have any real stories about corruption? And the colleague said, well, forgive me for coming from one of the least corrupt countries in the world. So may we, in 10 years' time, find ourselves in a place where the only story we can share about corruption is the equivalent of somebody stealing from a parking meter. In a democracy, citizens are the core of democracy. However, recently I gave my inaugural lecture where I spoke about the people versus democracy. That sounds like an, an oxymoron, isn't it? You can't have the people versus democracy because democracy is supposed to be people's power or people's rule. So how is it that you have democracy on the one side and the people on the other side? I think that's the problem. We have told ourselves that to win the fight against corruption, we need strong institutions. We write. We have told ourselves that to win the fight, against corruption, we need leadership, 
we were right. But we forgot to tell ourselves that to win the fight against corruption or any problem that society faces, we need the people at the center of it. Just think about the most recent scandals and corruption in this country. Who goes to court to support those who are accused of being corrupt? Who are the people who would say, I will fight for so and so, I'm prepared to kill for so and so, I'm prepared to die for so and so? When we started the investigation on state capture, you will know that Bell Pottinger started a campaign against us, white monopoly capital. But Bell Pottinger did not come and besiege the, white, the, the public protector office. It was young, impoverished people that day in and day night were sleeping at that office. Somebody has even captured them on video. And if you're a bystander, you'd feel so sad and say, these poor young people are being ignored by this woman. What has happened to her Ubuntu? But from our side, we knew that these people had been bought to do what they were doing. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why is the fight against corruption predominantly an intellectual fight? Why are the people on the side of their oppressors? Because people who steal from the poor are the oppressors of the poor. In fact, some, somebody wrote um, a Twitter message this week that was saying that people who steal from the poor hate the poor. Obviously, you wouldn't steal from somebody you love. But guess what? Who loves the people who steal from the poor? Poor people. That takes us to the question around how do we foster active citizenship? Kofi Annan started a foundation called Extremely Together. And when he started, his approach was that you educate young people against extremism. And life would change, young people would ab abandon extremism, and they would support democratic ways of doing things. But Kofi Annan and his foundation found out that that was not enough. One of our students in the final year low class said to us, hungry ears cannot hear. Well, in Zulu we say, inzala ibanga ulak. So think about it. Between an intellectual who's driving their four by four and lives in Waterkloof, who comes and says to you, let's fight against corruption, let's work for good governance, and they go back to Waterkloof. And the corrupt person who, when they have stolen, they remember to throw some crumbs back to the village. At least one day, a year, they deliver food parcels to every house. Who are you going to listen to? If you're a poor person, let's face it. The food person, isn't it? That's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's just food, even before you think about security, your first instinct is to deal with hunger. And hunger is a problem in this country. Hunger is the problem in this world. That's why we have UN's Sustainable Development Goals emphasizing an end to poverty, an end to, to hunger, an end to inequality. That's something that I personally realized when I was working as a public protector, that if we don't deal with social injustice, if we don't meet people where they are, let's forget about our fight against corruption. Because when people feel that the system is hacked against them, they find ways to hack the system back. And the corrupt will tell them that your poverty is explained by their wealth. And the corrupt will be stealing from them, of course. 
but it's a very complex system, isn't it? We know that uh, the reason ESCOM, for example, is dysfunctional is because not only is it that money was stolen, but tenders that shouldn't have been issued were issued as well. Policies that shouldn't have been taken were taken as well. I mean, look, we, ESCOM is battling with meeting its basic needs. It was about to commit to a nuclear energy project. That was at the point when Mudupi has cost more than 20 times what it was budgeted for. So before we had just looked at what was the reason for the time overruns, cost overruns at Mudupi, and why is it that the buyer pays when it's the service provider who's responsible for the time overruns and the cost overruns? Why is it? Because in business, that, that's not the way it works. If you commission somebody to build an office block for you and they've got cost overruns and time overruns, they will pay for it themselves. But in government. So we were about to do something. What does it say? It says there was a problem, but we were not prepared to cross it. That takes me firstly, if we're going to mobilize civil society to be a potent force against corruption, firstly, the anti-corruption struggle should meet people's needs. People should see a relationship between the results that we seek to achieve through anti-corruption and the change in their day-to-day -day lives. But it can't be promised to be something that's coming in 2030. It has to be something that they can begin to see now. I mean, I, I think about an ambulance. If, for example, somebody's sick, once they start hearing, hearing that ambulance sound, the siren, hope is ignited. But if somebody is told, oh, no, no, we don't know when is the ambulance going to die, come, they might even die just from lack of hope. So our people need to start seeing progress on a, on a day to day basis. But just lastly, then, to say, what then is corruption? I think the starting point, if we're going to involve people, is make sure that we simplify the Anti Corruption Act, the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. I've noticed that we are in this anti corruption conference. Not a single person has referenced the law that regulates corruption in this country because it's the most difficult act to understand. Just the definition of corruption. Well, in summary, firstly, the good thing about that act is that corruption transcends by bribery. It is about gratification. That gratification can come from you getting a position, you getting a party position, uh, your, your child uh, getting a favor in uh, being recruited for rugby. So it's not just, it's, it's not just um, bribery. So I think the starting point, if we're going to galvanize society, for me, one is link corruption to social justice. We know that corruption undermines social justice, but I do think that directly we should advance social justice to get people to understand that this anti-corruption movement is about not leaving them behind. Um, then the second thing after we've handled the, the social justice thing, let us handle the definition in the act. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to say though, thirdly, there has to be resonance among people with the anti-corruption message. So we need to let people know, what do you lose through corruption? Firstly, we lose money, and the minister spoke about 30 billion that we lose per year. We lose more than 30 billion per year, because what we are looking at, we're only looking at the money that is stolen through overbilling, overcharging, and um, um, overpayment. Overbilling, yes. But we also lose money through case law. Uh, once there's an allegation of corruption, remember the cash master case, for example, Sasa. You get services disrupted, you lose money through the legal system and then cost, and then time overruns that lead to cost overruns. Because once a project is stopped, then um, things, money starts ticking. So we also lose time, dear colleagues. 
Three, we lose morale. Excellence. There's a story that is told in the book, um, Making a Difference. Bob Geldof tells a story. In a corrupt environment, people don't perform. I recently went to the, to the police station to have my ID uh, stamped. Oh no, I had lost an ID. I wanted them to assist me. And they, they were very happy to see me, but the first thing they wanted to tell me about is they've been asking about why some people were promoted. Just all they wanted was an answer, was why other people jumped the queue. They deserve that answer. Section 33 of the Constitution, Section 195 of the Constitution. Let's say the others who jumped the queue, that was perfectly okay. There was no corruption involved. But in the absence of an explanation, what it does is the morale is killed. And the story that Bob Goldov tells is about monkeys that were asked to do the same task. And then one group of monkeys, the monkeys thought they were all getting cucumbers because maybe there was no, nothing nice and there were only cucumbers. And every monkey was performing the task, which was collecting a rock and giving it back to the man who's doing the experiment. Until the monkeys, the B set of monkeys, realized that actually the other group were, were getting grapes. They were not getting cucumbers. <laughs> and me and you know that unless you really are strictly healthy, I would rather get grapes too. What happened in that experiment is that the monkeys that were getting cucumbers withdrew their investment in the task. They started being slow, they started not rocking up, etc. So what does it, a corrupt environment undermines service delivery because you get people who feel that the system is hacked and then you get people who are not, um, who are not working to their full potential. It happens the same thing with business. Young business people would say, what's the point of doing this? If I tender on this particular thing, I'm not going to get the tender because somebody with a suitcase and political connections is going to get it. But sometimes that's not true. It's just the expectation. People think this, the system is hacked. People don't make themselves available for jobs because they think we're going to prefer our relatives even if we're not going to do that. So what do we also lose? Policy. I spoke about the policies where you prioritize one policy instead of another. For example, you have toilets, you have um, toilets that need to be fixed in rural areas, but maybe you're prioritizing sanitary pads because you're going to buy them for 50 cents from China, and then they tend to be inflated which is something that has happened for real. Um, I'm not saying pets should not be bought, actually. I just submitted Kilimanjaro this year for pets, but I'm saying in the big scheme of things between... <laughs> Thank you. It's just a question of your policy choices should be based on your vision, should be based on your strategy. It should also be based on Section 237 of the Constitution, which is about uh, um, uh, prioritizing your constitutional responsibilities. It should also be based on Section 195. Um, law enforcement suffers. We've heard from the colleagues that law enforcement suffers. Um, the social compact is, is broken. I just want to end with the social compact thing that poverty in South Africa currently is at 55.5%. Among indigenous African South Africans, poverty is at 64.2%, according to Stats SA. According to Stats SA, some provinces have even far more rates of poverty. Eastern Cape, 72%. So that means among those indigenous Africans in this country, one person is supposed to support three. But in the end, nobody supports anyone because we also have the working poor among us. In that particular midst, you start a factory in the rural areas. Everyone wants a job in that factory. One of the companies I met last week, they started that job and they started a factory that was going to create 2.5 million jobs a mine. But the locals are prepared to close it down. 
Why are people prepared to close it down? It's because everyone is hungry. So what has happened is that in the midst of corruption, in the midst of poverty and inequality, people are withdrawing their, their social license to operate. You know, social license to operate historically was, was thought to be something that is given to one mind by the community. That, that's, that's the intangible contract between you and the community. You have a license to operate. That's beyond the license you've been given to government. But today, that concept applies to all companies. Companies are struggling to move forward in townships, in rural areas, et cetera, because of the high levels of poverty. But also corruption. So dear colleagues, I think we should thank the colleagues that have started this because it's the start of a process it can't end here. I believe that we need to go to townships, to rural areas. I challenge the colleagues that you take this conversation to, to 4,392 municipal wards to get people to talk about the vision for South Africa that is in the Constitution, their role in delivering that vision, their role in being their own eyes and ears. And this is what the World Bank calls social accountability. But people can only exercise social accountability if they believe in the vision, if they believe in the system, if there's transparency in the system, and more importantly, if they think that whatever they do or say will matter. And that means we also have to protect our whistleblowers. And I'm, I'm glad that the minister said we need to, we, uh, there are efforts to protect whistleblowers, because we all thank whistleblowers, but when they face, when they face the, the backlash, they face it all by themselves. I can tell you stories about the ones who whistleblow on state capture, mental health challenges, lost your house, and everyone says they hate corruption, but when you are looking for a job as a whistleblower, they don't seem to love you. So if we're moving forward, I think let's have these conversations in the rural areas. But for me, coming from Stellenbosch, coming from t the Tuma Foundation, I'm also saying let's combine the anti-corruption conversation with the conversation about creating a Marshall Plan or a Musa Plan on social justice. That's the plan where me, you, and everyone else plays our role in combating poverty and inequality. And in that process, we become part of a force, a social accountability force that makes sure that whilst we generate more resources from civil society, the resources that are already within government are not lost. We also make sure that companies are not part of the problem because part of the problem, we have a problem with corruption, is we tend to think corruption is only those who receive the bribes. But corruption is a bilateral crime. But secondly, we tend to think that corruption is only in the public sector. Cor corruption is a societal problem and it's a global problem. But anyway, Ethiopians say, when spider webs combine, they can tie up a lion. And corrupt people understand that. We too understand that that's why we're in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Marinzela. And I think th there's an important takeaway from that, that corruption is not just a silent economic victimless crime. It has real impact on the delivery of services and accessing human rights. Think about you know, accessing schools or healthcare or policing or housing. Ordinary people in South Africa are facing this every day. So just to bolster the previous panel, we are now going to be joined by Mrs. Busisiwe Mabuso, who is the first female CEO of Business Leadership South Africa. Um, Prof. Marincello was, leading, was leaving was also the first female public protector. So this is a good example of what excellent female leadership looks like. So to Ms. Mavuso, the questions that we're posing to her today is business has taken a huge knock in the last 10 years with a lot of trust being eroded in the sector. 
and we would just want to, oh, I would like to find out what does a good corporate citizen look like and what is business accountability going to be in the next 10 years? Thank you, Ms. Mabuso. Colleagues, good afternoon. Um, I'm not going to be long, unfortunately, because of the pressures of time. But I think allow me to start by saying that the strength of leadership is in the followers. And unless and until followers are willing to hold accountable though, those that are in leadership, then nothing is going to happen. Unless and until we realize from an active citizenry perspective that we hold the power as the followers. Nothing is going to happen. The duration of oppression is never determined by the oppressor. It is always determined by the oppressed. So what is our role going to be in as far as this notion of active citizenry is concerned? That is the theme that we've been given as this panel. And unfortunately, we're not going to have an opportunity to further interrogate it precisely because of time pressures. So I think maybe let me start by saying that for me, it is disheartening to see where we are as a country because of corruption. It is unfortunate that we are sitting with an economy that is nearing collapse, all because of our own doing. You see, for this one, as South Africans, we have no one to blame. South Africa has, or South Africans have caused the collapse of our economy. And we as citizens have been standing as bystanders and as spectators in this thing because for whatever reason, it is just too much trouble to do the right thing. For whatever reason, it is easier to look the other way and pretend as if you don't see. As Martin Luther King Jr. says, that things begin to go wrong when people become silent about things that matter. And I think all of us as South Africans, we are guilty of that. The state capture project has cost this country 100 billion rands in the last 10 years. And those that have costed the state capture project are saying that this country has lost 1.5 trillion rands in the last decade. We're currently sitting in a situation where South Africa has a budget deficit of 1.4 trillion rands. So if the last 10 years didn't happen, you'll probably maybe agree with me that as a country and as an economy, we wouldn't be sitting where we're sitting. Those that have done the numbers have extrapolated where we were in 2009 or in 2007 during the Tabombegi era when we once had 43 consecutive quarters of positive economic growth. They are saying that if we had continued on that trajectory, unemployment in this country would be sitting at 16%. We would have banked a trillion rands into the fiscus and our economic growth would be sitting at 6% not the 0.5% that is currently sitting in. And by the way, as of this morning, it is no longer 0.5% growth that South Africa is going to achieve this year because of the load shedding. We are probably looking at 0.2 or 0.3%. How are we supposed to grow our economy if that is what we're facing? South Africa currently has unemployment of 30%. We have more people that are unemployed than those that are employed in all the provinces except Gauteng and the Western Cape. We're sitting with 56% unemployment. We're sitting with growing domestic inequality. We've just overtaken Brazil as the most unequal society in the world. Social instability is the norm today in South Africa. And as Professor Matonzela has just said, because people are seeing this helplessness, and this hopelessness. So the question we're probably gonna to have to be asking ourselves as leaders, both in government and in business, is that are we really doing our job? If our people have less faith in leadership, because we as leaders are failing in that which we have to do. South Africa today is what it is because we as leaders are not what we ought to be. 
So maybe going forward, we're going to have to look at what is this notion of leadership in the first place? How do we choose leaders in the first place? Do we have the notion of ethical leadership as a consideration? And by the way, ethical leadership is tautologous because leadership, by definition, ought to be ethical. Because in leadership, because in leadership there has to be integrity. So if we, as this government, are advancing the names of some previous corrupt ministers to go and serve in parliament as chairpersons of parliamentary committees, what are we saying? If these people that we know that have brought the economic collapse of the South African economy are roaming the streets free, if Marcus Yoste is still sitting comfortably in, I don't know, Stellenbosch, are we not spitting in the faces of those that we actually have to be delivering to as leaders. If we have just appointed the Joburg mayor, I've forgotten his name, and yet he's tainted by corruption, what are we saying? So it can be right. But again, as I said, the strength of leadership is in the followers. Unless and until we, as the followers are willing to hold accountable those that are in leadership, nothing is going to happen. The duration of oppression is never determined by the oppressor. It is always determined by the oppressed. We're sitting in a country where we have state-owned entities that are at the brink of collapse and thereby eroding our public finances and bringing the economic collapse along with them. The biggest albatross that we have in this country is the 670 billion exposure of debt that we have because of these SOEs. SAA has just gone into business rescue because of corruption. We're sitting with stage four load shedding today in ESCOM because of corruption. PRASA has just been put under administration this morning because of corruption. It cannot be. And I think in all of this, I know I'm citing government examples, but as Professor Matonzela again said, that you know with these things there is always a corruptor and a corruptee. So I say this in the full acknowledgement that ESCOM today is a crime scene because we as business were complicit. If business didn't participate in this corruption, we wouldn't be sitting where we're sitting. So I think when we tell the story of corruption, I think we're going to have to have a more honest debate about what the role of business has been in bringing to the collapse this economy. Actually, those who have done the numbers will tell you that corruption in the private sector is five times what it is in the public sector. So we're probably going to have to engage with this from a different lens because private sector is indeed not innocent when it comes to this. And probably maybe the more pertinent discussion that we're going to have to have is what has happened to the South African society. What is it about the moral and ethical fiber of the South African society? Why has the degeneration gone to the lengths that it has? And maybe we're probably going to have to ask ourselves that what is happening within families? What is happening within our homes? Because remember, those employees who are in government and business as well, all of them are a microcosm of a society. They are someone's mother, father, brother, sister, daughter, son. So what conversations are we having around the dinner tables? If South Africa is so, I don't know what is the word. If, 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 if corruption means nothing to us, what is the conversation therefore we are having around our dinner tables? So for me, active citizenry becomes important. You would remember that the state capture project was brought down by this notion of active citizenship. If it wasn't for people saying enough and no more, 
It wouldn't have happened. I remember I had this conversation earlier on with my, so PLSA, by the way, is the only organization of CEOs in the country. My membership is about 80 CEOs of JSC listed companies. So if you look at the JSC, 400 companies that are listed and look at the top 100 companies. Those are the CEOs that I lead in PLSA. And I remember earlier on this year, around May, for the first time I saw Alexander cross the M1 bridge into Sutton in the guise of a service delivery protest. And I looked at it and I said, but there are no municipal offices in Sentin. And when I had the conversation with my CEOs a few weeks later, I said, you know, if this that has just happened doesn't make us as business to sit, pause, and reflect, and say, how does business meaningfully come on board in changing the social and economic patterns in this country. I don't know what will. Look, whether we like it or not, as business, we have to have this conversation. Because unfortunately for us, this fight is being brought to our doorstep. The gender-based violence march took place in Sentin. They went and they shut Sentin down at 3 a.m. in the morning. So I looked at that again and said that, what is the response of business going to be? Can the business of business continue to be just business? Should business not start engaging with this from a different perspective? Something is gonna have to give and it's gonna have to give very quickly. It can be right that when we introduce the national minimum wage of 3,500, business is the first one to raise its hand to say that, you know, if we're going to be paying people 3,500 rands, then our shareholders are going to complain. It can be. We introduced, <laughs> we introduced the national minimum wage because 43% of the people that wake up every day and say, I'm going to work, we're going to benefit from it. 43% of people who wake up every day don't earn 3,500 rand. It cannot be. It cannot be right that you only have five million people who earn enough to pay pairs you earn in this country, and you have 18 million people who are dependent on some form of social grant or the other. It can't be right that only 1.7 million people in this country contribute 80% of the pairs you earn that is collected by SARS. It can be. In a country of 59 million people, it is hugely unsustainable. So I don't care which way we as business choose to look at this, but I guess we're gonna have to first realize that something is gonna have to give and it's gonna have to give very quickly because unfortunately, unfortunately, Sentin is going to be shut down for real. The, this richest square mile in the African continent is going to be shut down because people are going to force us to do what is right because we are failing to do so ourselves. So, no, I'm actually coming to an end. Because <laughs> I have to. So, colleagues, for me, I think one of the days when we actually put people on pedestals. One of the days when we look at people's titles and we think that we don't have the right to question them or to actually ask them the questions that we ought to be asking them. So for me, the only thing that is actually going to turn the economic trajectory of this country around is this notion of active citizenship. So what, that, what does that therefore mean for you and I? How are we going to start practicing this? If our politicians are failing, if government is failing, if business is failing, if the unions are failing, then unfortunately, the only other social partner that can make this work is civil society. And what therefore becomes our role as civil society? And let me go again repeat this quote. Things start to go wrong when we become silent about things that matter. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.
Uh, thank you, Ms. Mabu. So I really wish we had more time so that you would have been able to engage and ask questions, but hopefully the organizers would you know, convene some uh, similar events sometime soon. We shouldn't only do this on International Anti-Corruption Day. If we want to deal with corruption in our country, every day should be Anti-Corruption Day. So hopefully we can uh, convene and you'll have another opportunity to engage with Ms. Mavuso about this. She raised an important issue about the moral question and what's going on around our dinner tables, the discussions that we're having. And from my experience, what we've started to see is that corruption has become a bit of a pervasive culture in our society. We have become a bit desensitized towards it. So one of the, uh, I think Advocate Batoya had asked how many uh, of you would pay a bribe to a police officer to avoid a fine? And the truth is a lot of people will engage in corruption in order to avoid a consequence. And it's become much more pervasive amongst young people in particular. So there was a recent survey called the, Glo the Global Corruption Barometer, where it said that young people aged between 18 to 35 were more likely to engage in acts of corruption. In some of our engagements with young people, they have told us about how they actually budget for their bribes on a weekend. So if you're going to go out, you know you're going to be drinking and having a party, you're going to budget an extra 200 rand, so you're going to give it to the police officer to avoid facing any consequences for drinking and driving. And this is part of this culture that has become pervasive. So the next, uh, our last panelist who is here is Father Mkachwa, and he's going to respond to this idea of corruption becoming a culture and what we can do to actually challenge this so that in the next 10 years, young people are not budgeting for their bribes or for their driver's license. So please allow me to welcome Father Mkachwa. One, two, three, or at least there are some people left, so I'll speak. <laughs> um, program director and all protocol observed. <clears throat> Last month I visited a friend of mine, you know, actually a family, and there was a small boy there, one of their kids. He was very, very talkative and very alive. So I just asked him one question, when you grow up, what do you really want to become? He piped up and said, I want to be a corruption. <laughs> now, for me, the message was that, one, the word corruption is probably so confused and confusing that it becomes very important for us to sit back sometimes and do a proper analysis. So my approach then to the subject is going to be slightly different from the previous speakers who have been addressing very concrete, specific issues and reporting on the work that they are actually doing. So I'm rather going to focus on the importance of the social system because that is very important to do a critical analysis of what kind of system or social order allows corruption to flourish. But before doing so, let me quote what Madiba said when he addressed Parliament in his inaugural address. He said, out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long, must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud. Our daily deeds as ordinary South Africans must produce an actual South African reality that will reinforce humanity's belief in justice, strengthen its confidence in the nobility of the human soul, and sustain all our hopes for a glorious life for all. Soon after that, Madiba called for the RDP of the soul. And this was followed by a decision by the new democratic government, 1994-1996 that then agreed that what we needed to do as a new country was to uh, embark on a project called developmental state. Now, I'm referring to that because corruption is the antithesis of everything that project tries to achieve, particularly for the poor 
and the formerly disadvantaged uh, 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 people. I also feel then that it's very important for us to take a step back and ask ourselves, why is it that especially poor people are the victims of corruption in a very, very, very special way? I would say in maybe in a twofold manner. One, the people that are in positions of power and influence, who have access to resources that are meant for the development of millions of our people, they are the ones who control the resources. And that's where sometimes the biggest a, a challenge uh, comes about. Particularly for me, this becomes an ethical issue. Because if you take away the little bit that poor people should actually be enjoying, you are actually destroying those people. And that's a big issue for me. Because the poor people are not always in a position to be a, in position of power, to dispense the largesse and, and so forth. So they are on the receiving end most of the time. But there's also another way in which poor people find themselves victims of a, a corruption, but in a very strange way, in the sense that most of them, in order just to survive, they probably find that they have to bribe, they have to pay other people to render services to which they are actually I mean, entitled to by virtue of being citizens. So there's a twofold way in which a poor people also get a, a impacted upon by, the, um, uh, by corruption. Now corruption is as much a part of life in all its ambiguities and paradoxes as are ethical issues pertaining to sexuality, the environment, business, medicine, war, and peace, to name but a few. There can be no simplistic answers to any of these issues. Those who focus merely on the legal aspects of corruption and are quick to point anomalies are in fact being ethical minimalists. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll also then agree that a ethics becomes a very important tool to deal with the cancer of, um, uh, of, of corruption. Now by ethics, of course, simply I mean that ethics is a discipline, is the way in which we determine values, and it is a study of how we value what we value. At a personal level, it is the ability to discern right and wrong, good and bad, and to choose freely in an informed way to live by those values. So I think some of previous speakers have already pointed out that maybe the biggest challenge facing us is one of lack of values. Because if, for instance, you are not guided in your actions by certain values, ethical values or moral values and so on, what stops you from behaving in any way that may even be totally destructive to society? Because for you, there's no right, there's no wrong. All what is right is what, you, what gives you certain benefits and which may be detrimental to society. In one conference when a, where a, a former president Mbegi spoke, he asked one question. What gives birth to corrupt practice? What are the social circumstances that enable corrupt practice to become so pervasive and entrenched as a social phenomenon. But later on, he answered his own question, at least gave his own views. He says, 
In our own national case as South Africans, we would make bold to say that a basic factor which informs corrupt practice is the disjuncture that has occurred between the spiritual and the material human needs. Didn't say the religious and the spiritual. It continues. It seems clear that in this contest, the material has assumed precedence over the spiritual. Now, if that is true, then a simplistic and moralistic form of pointing fingers at private individuals without engaging in a systemic analysis of the problem would be sinister, if not hypocritical. Because we are really touching on the surface, you know, the periphery and so on. We are not going to the heart of the, uh, 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 of the problem. Now, in the same speech, other speakers re-echoed what Mbegi had said. And that's why we had a long discussion and debate about, the, about analyzing the social system. Because very often what we deal with, these are symptoms of something that is fundamentally rotten. But is visible, is tangible. But the real poison that accounts for some of those very evil deeds and, and so on is very seldom overlooked by many of us. And that's why then institutions of higher learning, um, institutions for research become very, very, very important. Because they also help us to put in place strategies and systems to combat the very heart of corruption. Now, a vital aspect of systems thinking, which I'm suggesting, is to try to consider as many angles as possible. Interestingly enough, people like uh, uh, Karl Polanyi says something very interesting. He says, in his critique of society and the economy, that capital's market destroys nations, relations of kinship, neighborhoods, profession, and creed, replacing them with the relentless pursuit of personal wealth by citizens. In his own words, he says, citizens have become atomistic and individualistic. Now, that mindset drives people to a pathological pursuit of quick wealth, the more the better. Not just enough to have, but quick wealth, whichever way you do it. And I thought that was very, very, very important because for me, uh, his observation is quite contrary to the spirit of Ubuntu and human solidarity. Today, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, one of our responsibilities is probably to ensure that our people are uh, actually educated and informed critically about the nature of corruption and how it impacts on their own lives and how it becomes almost an enemy of the country as a whole. Now my point is that any reflection on corruption must be rooted in a broad based or systemic approach to the issue. It is not just about private morality, although that comes into the equation as well, but it is about social construction and the many ways, large or small, in which we all have the potential to contribute to a better life for all. The challenge of corruption is ultimately a challenge to restore our faith in democracy. It is to believe in the democratic process. 
If, as Tabo Mbeki says, corruption is a social phenomenon, albeit one that is negative, then it can also be controlled and eliminated by another social phenomenon, the positive force of democracy. And this is a challenge then to all of us to roll up our sleeves and do whatever we can in our own various situations, in what we do, and so on. And in this particular regard, the moral generation movement is particularly interested in issues such as this one. And some of you will remember that uh, a decision was taken by the ruling party that the Charter of Positive Values which is a flagship project of MRM, should be included in the curriculum in all our, uh, in other words, all our schools from a very, very, very young age and so on, they should have access to the contents of that booklet, which has identified nine positive values. Now, I won't waste your time going to that, I'm sure. Hopefully, you, have, you will have at least read that book and is very, very, very uh, important. So I therefore suggest that uh, uh, organizations, uh, individuals, institutions should work together in order to combat an evil that affects all of us in one way or the other. I'm sorry that our, um, our speaker from the United Nations is not here. I was going to apologize to her when she crucified my name and couldn't pronounce Mangaliso. I said she shouldn't feel, feel too bad about that because when I was, uh, I made a visit in Chicago to a certain uh, monastery, which was very huge and housed lots of uh, visitors, priests and so on from different parts of the world. So every time a call came in, there was a lady who spoke with a very lazy voice to sorry, Father Sorenso, Father Sorenso, telephone, take your call, and then you'd pick it up. So this particular day, I hear this lady busy, a, 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 almost shouting. Said, Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, <laughs> telephone. <laughs> so then as I was going out to do something else and so on and so on, she sees me. And she, she was mad with me, said, but I've been calling you and telling you that to pick up your phone. So she couldn't say Smangali, so she corrupted me something like Mona Lisa, which is very different from what we do. Thank you. Um, colleagues, thank you for that. I know that you are all hungry. Um, there is just one more item on the agenda. It's a very short one, and then you'll go into lunch. Um, I'm just going to allow my colleague to introduce the poet that is up next. But thank you again, and I apologize for you not being able to engage with the panel. Thanks. Thank you, colleagues. Once again, apologies for starting late and ultimately overlapping. Um, I want to call upon us two young people that took part in the BRICS competition um, that won second places in both the video and poster category, Ms. Tutulan Dunge and Mr. Pompi Matiba. Where is he? Okay, it's fine. I'm going to show you the video where Bombi is, is explaining his work, the logic behind the poster that you know, got him this far, such that he secured second place. I was hoping that he would be here, but we can't locate him. But be that as it may, we will make the most use of it. My part as I pledged to fight against corruption, which I knew this global crisis is diverting public resources for private gain. Because my design speaks about anti-corruption. My design speaks about unity. With my design, I was simply saying, enough is enough. Let us all come together and fight against corruption. 
My name is Obisi Tero Hamachiba, and I'm going to be the voice for all nations. Lovely. Thank you. And Tutula Dunge is going to deliver a poet, poetry item. But before we do that, I'm going to share with you a video that made her to secure position number two. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sadly, I'll be reciting the very poem <laughs> that you heard just now, but that was very fast and very short um, for the contest because it had to be two minutes. A wise man once said, bad company corrupts good character. I remember a time when singing the national anthem would give me goosebumps, a time where the phrase proudly South African resonated with every core value of the Constitution and our Freedom Charter. I can still hear the echo articulated by our former state president, Thabo Mbeki, when he said, I'm an African. I can still feel the shivers cascade down my spine of how proud we were as a nation as we watched our resilient freedom fighter, Nelson Mandela, step into a crowd at Ellis Park Stadium wearing a Springbok jersey to put the cherry on top of what's some to be a historical World Cup for South Africa. You see, my country is my beloved, and like any fulfilling relationship, conflict is inevitable. My country is not my enemy. My enemy is this intrusive stranger who's lured my country onto a bed covered with sheets of nepotism, greed, and systematic chains of corruption. They say love conquers all. What about ethics? What about values? Do you know? Do you really know the cost of corruption? In South Africa alone, 20 bil 27 billion of our GDP and 30 billion of our state budget. 76,000 jobs lost annually. You see, until corruption permeates your workplace, your family space, your place of worship, your learning institutions, and the very foundation in which your community is built on, you will never fully comprehend its devastating effects. 
I for one cry out, Ubuntu, as I wave my flag vigorously towards my enemy. Remember, please remember, goal 16, peace, justice, and strong institution. Girl child waving out her flag vigorously towards her enemy. Remember, please remember, the National Development Plan 2030, chapter 14. Ubuntu, a person maintains value by building strong tides with others. I am because we are. And because we are, together we must move in unity as a collective action that engages in thought leadership discussions that will increase the momentum of building ethical programs. It is a mandate of these talks that will offer cross-pollination, inclusion theories for the country, for the continent, and the world at large. Because we are, we need to shift our focus in building strong rafts to enable us to surf through unethical dilemmas. It ought to be our mission to show the world that we can be responsible, accountable, fair, and transparent. Because we are, rafts are not enough. In the words of Peter Dacker, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Introspection is always required when you're constantly making decisions that affect all our stakeholders. And I concur, the PLUS filter, it will address policies, legalities, universal values, and more importantly, self-analysis. And because we are, we need to hold one another accountable. We need to speak in a common language, a language that will detect, prevent, investigate, and report any such persons who deliberately violates the principles of growth and sustainability for all. I, I challenge you today for your future, our future, your dignity, and together alike, pledge the ethical honor. And remember, you cannot feature in a future you do not picture. I picture a better world in the near future. The pressing question is, do you? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when I came in there this morning, the wall was full. Now the wall is still full, but it is half full. But anyway, uh, let me not be your enemy uh, in terms of the food that you are going to eat. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the staff, uh, partners of the PSC, which is United Nations, UNISA, and even uh, Department of Public Service and Administration. These are the partners in making sure that this event happens uh, once a year. And let me thank uh, the distinguished speakers, all of them, uh, who have really prepared uh, for this session. And let me thank the participants who are here and also those who have been participating through social media uh, because this uh, session was broadcast through social media. And let me thank uh, the program directors, all of them who have uh, ensured that this ship from morning until now is not uh, a sinking. It was excellent work uh, that they have done. And Professor Sumado Dasfigeni indicated that we have got a one of the best constitution. Uh, but we still steal. 
I like that one. It rhymes so nice. We still steal. This best constitution is founded on the values and principles. And one of those values is supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law. And one of the principles is about the high standard of professional ethics. So we all know about these issues. But where are they? These are the values and principles which are written in the constitution or on the, uh, the walls or on the banners, but they are not inculcated in our minds. I think that's what we need to do at all times. So we need to take this corruption and give it a proper uh, name. It's an enemy of the people. And what we do with the enemy, we must deal with corruption in that way. We must hate it and make sure that it doesn't thrive. And we have to go and start at the schools when kids are still small. I know one thing that uh, we do in the public service, we discourage officials from being thanked for doing their work. So if there is a gift of 350 or more, it's discouraged, it must not be taken. Uh, as officials of government, they must do their work and they must not be thanked for doing that work. Because if they are thanked, it might be the foundation of corrupt practices which are coming in, because there's going to be payback times. However, it must go even to the private sector. I know most of you are driving, they go to filling stations, and uh, an attendant there fills your petrol, and then cleans your window, checks your tires, and then the next thing is, that's, by the way, that's what that uh, attendant is expected to do. That's his or her work. And then you take 20 rand out of your pocket and say, thank you very much. So we're thanking the attendant for doing his or her work, and yet is being discouraged in the public service. So maybe it's a debate that must happen that should we really thank people? Should we really pay tips? Because these are the tips, what we call tips. We have even given it a nice weight. But is it not encouraging? Uh, paying people for doing their work, which they are supposed to be doing. Maybe that's something that we need to do. And uh, lastly, uh, in closing, I listened to the former president, uh, Khalima Mutlante. He says, we are really lowering our standards. And there are 10 commandments. We all know them. But we have introduced the 11th one, which says, thou shall not be caught. So you can do anything else, but thou shall not be caught. And people will do all sorts of things and not to get caught, but they continue doing all sorts of wrong things. So with these few words, let's give ourselves a round of applause for a successful meeting. Thank you very much. Before we go, before we go, I need to make an announcement. Um, and before I make an announcement with regard to food arrangements, I just want to call Lieutenant General Libya, who will give the gifts to our um, presenters on the program, uh, just to thank you for a job well done. Today was a success because of your participation. Can I have other colleagues, please, 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 Five minutes will be out of here, please. Two minutes, I know, please. Okay. Yeah. For, for the speakers that are still remaining, can you kindly come forward so that we can hand over um, your gifts? Thank you so much. We truly appreciate your participation. All right. I think we can all come. Right? Okay. Not, not one by one. All right. You can all come so that Lieutenant General can give you your gifts. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And VIPs, members of the diplomatic community, please follow me. I will direct you where you'll be served lunch. Thank you.